Ethan, great to have you on the show. Great ha- <laughs> yeah, great to be here. Ethan, <laughs> it is nice to have you. Thank you. All right, so here's how I understand what happened. Dr. Han was on my show a yes. year ago, right? Or um, over a year ago. Yeah, over a year ago now. Yeah. And he talks about you and your brother who were at the time Calvinist and at a Calvinist college. And that discussion led to your brother being kicked out of the Calvinist college, yes. a college that you had already been kicked out of for holding yes. Catholic views. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then the next day, Dr. Hahn calls me in a panic. <laughs> Matt, we need to edit that out. I didn't mean to say their names. And we somehow, do you remember taking that out? I don't know if you remember. Stuff happens. Maybe. Anyway. <laughs> I never heard that side of the story. That's funny. Yeah, he felt terrible about yeah. it. Yeah. It's because I think Liam afterwards was like, Can we get can we get that video? I'd just love to keep that somewhere because that was that was just awesome. Did you so, ever get it? No, we didn't. I think we couldn't find it or yeah, something. Yeah, I think we probably used the YouTube editor to because I think he said it at the beginning to take it out. Yes. So it means it's lost. It was at the beginning and then there was forever. another part later later on. Ah. So it was yeah, there was two two parts. Yeah. So today we want to talk about your conversion, yeah. Calvinism, Catholicism, and things like that. So yeah. I'm excited because I don't know you. We've met a few times. So yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Were you raised a Protestant? I was raised a Protestant, yeah. My parents um, my parents were Catholics uh, growing up, and then um, they left the church a few years after I was born. So I was baptized Catholic, mm. um, but I never spent a conscious hour, I could remember at least, in the Catholic church. And um and they, yeah, they left because they ended up um, meeting a priest after, um, you know, just being, becoming more interested in the faith. They went back and asked about, you know, just, just they just had questions about the faith and they were told, you know, you just do these actions and you get a mortal sin forgiven or something like that. You know, they didn't understand the theology of indulgences. Um, the priest likely didn't either. Um, and so it was put in a way that they were like, I just do this action and I have sin forgiven. That's not really, mm-hmm. it doesn't really make sense. Um that and then they were like, you know, Adam, Adam and Eve, they're not real. They're just they're just these mythical kind of figures. And so my parents were like, Yep, I'm out of here with that. And mm. so they became evangelicals. Um then and then my dad, after a few years, ended up becoming a Calvinist. Um story there is just he uh he, he was he was an elder at this evangelical church after being there for a few years. And the um the he started just noticing things that were just like this just doesn't like sit right with me you know like at, at a lot of churches like that you'll have um in evangelical churches yes, that aren't calvinists yes just, yep. yeah it was it was more it was we we call them um arminians yeah. they're they're a, they're a version of um semi pelagians as we would know them mm-hmm. uh, so it's kind of a um yeah, it's kind of like God, you work together with God to be saved. It's not like God works salvation out in and through you, you know. Um, it's true in a sense that we work together with God, but again, we work together with him because he works it in us, right? We love because he first loves us, loved us, right? Um, so my dad would notice that things just didn't, um, they didn't, they, they weren't working well. It was like, you know, if you if you are just moved to believe, you know, come up, come up on stage and, um, you know, sign your name on this thing or, or whatever, you know, it's like little things like that. It's like, give your life to Christ and you kind of do that once. And then people will just kind of fall away, walk away. It wasn't really super discipleship based, you know? And so my dad was like, this doesn't make sense. And so as he, as he started talking with people a lot, um, at least this is the way the story was told to me. Um, my, the pastor I had before I left to come to go to, um, RBC, Reformation Bible College in 2018, um, he walked up to my dad and was like, you are a Calvinist. And my, and my dad's like, I'm a what now? You just called me, what did you call me? <laughs> did he use this like, as a pejorative? Or no, as a... no, it was like a, it was a good thing in okay. this case. But my dad was like, you call me a what now? <laughs> and he's like, you're a Calvinist. And my dad's like, huh? Um, what even is that? He's like, predestination, this, that, and the other thing, you know, just works through it all. And my dad's like, you're right. I think I'm a Calvinist. And so he started reading all the Puritans and mm. that's kind of when I started to- And that to, clicked with him. With that his clicked with view him of, very well. I yeah. See. I remember some of my first, my first, like, I was around my probably nine or 10 and I, I was still, we were still going to that evangelical church. And so I was thinking, you know, I have to like dedicate my life to Christ, which was really confusing for me even then. And this is going to get into the conversion story too, because all of this starts to make sense as you start to grasp what the, like how salvation actually works, you know? When I, as an outsider looking in, and so this might be completely mistaken, yeah. I don't mean to offend anybody, no, sure. but the Calvinists just seem like serious Protestants. Like the rad trads of the Protestant community. Yeah, there's something and true. And they all have beards. 
<laughs> they all have beards. Just like rad trads. Although I think rad trads have patchy beards and <laughs> Calvinists have like have thick full, ass yeah. beards. <laughs> they, they have actual awesome beards. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I part of the of, requirement, I think. You heard of um, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, I mean, I think he's just the classic, you know, beard, cigar. He's, he's a reformed Baptist. So he's like a. He's a Calvinist on the Baptist end of things. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a... So that impression thing. that I have, that's not based in anything but appearances. Yeah. What, what's true about that as far as serious Protestants? Um, the, I would say they definitely are serious Protestants. Um, it, it's more serious today um, than, than you're going to find in evangelical groups, but you're going to find other very serious groups as well. There's very serious groups of Lutherans, um, Anglicans. There's, there's some... Um, is there just more sort of academic rigor behind Calvinism yes, today? Yes, there is. I would say it's not that you can't find it in different Protestant communities if you go back far enough or yeah. read certain specialists today. But it feels like they're they're the only ones who really have kept a solid um, tradition. Um, I think they they actually have they actually have confessions going through time. So like it's a confession of faith, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Synod of Dort, things like this. Um, yeah, this is something that I get introduced to when I go to RBC. I didn't know a whole lot about it before that. But um, I knew my dad had had read the um, Westminster Confession, said it was great, things like that. But there there were like a few disagreements when I started getting there that that um, that I had with, um, with my dad after time went on because they believed in infant baptism and things mm -hmm. like that. I had no idea what that was coming in. I was like, that seems weird. Don't, aren't you just baptized because, you know, it's a sign that you're saved, right? Or saved and don't really, it's defined as um, back then it was more like you're um, regenerated, um, which is kind of interior renewal um, by the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's, there's justification and sanctification. So in, in Protestant theology, um, and this was what I was taught growing up too, is that justification is by a legal imputation. So, so Christ's merits on the cross are, um, imputed to you or counted to you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and your, your demerits or your sin is counted to him. So mm -hmm. God punishes your sin in Christ on the cross and he imputes his merits to you. Right. So that's the basis of how salvation occurs in that system. Um, so that is counted to you, and then and then on that on that legal basis, God will regenerate the believer. So the Holy Spirit comes in and renews them interiorly. Um, the thing is, it sounds beautiful. It 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 is in some <clears throat> ways. It's until I you know start it gets to, ugly, but it, yes. it, it's just the way you put that. Sounds yes, very you, clean. You, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yes, you could put it very beautifully, and and there's and all of that. I think. Um, is true in some sense. Um, just it's the way that it's re it, it's the way that it works itself out that it it misses. Um, and that's something we can get to a little more. It's hard to know yeah. if we're going to circle back to this or if now's the time that we should actually Think exist. So? I'm okay. afraid we won't get back to it. You're afraid. Okay. So I love how you just put that. Why don't you say it as closely as you can? Yes. As a, what the Catholic Church teaches. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So from. <clears throat> This is um, this is an immensely complicated discussion that's been going on for like over five hundred well, years. You've got you know, two so minutes. So sum it two up. minutes. Oh yeah. boy. No. Um, okay, let's go. Um, so the the position the Reformed theologians take, at least um, later Reformed theologians, you have earlier ones who hold different things, is that there's a legal, yeah, the the legal imputation of the righteousness of Christ to to man's account, as it were, is what is what causes um, it's temporally at least before regeneration so it comes in time before somebody mm -hmm. is in changed interiorly um so that's the that's the forgiveness of sins on the one hand on the other um it's the infusion of grace um which a lot of reformed people are going to maybe object to um so this is this is one of the funny things too is um i think when you look at the Westminster Confession, which is, it was done in 1646 by the Puritans. Um, it's very, it's probably like the most, the most used um, Calvinist um, confession of faith. That is going to talk about the, how in uh, question 77 of the catechism, of uh, the larger catechism, it's going to talk about how justification and sanctification differ in that one is a legal imputation, which is for the remission of sins. In the other, in the other, God infuses grace and, mm -hmm. and exercises it there on, unto use or something like that. I forget. Okay. I haven't read it in a long time, but, um, 
But that was something that stuck out to us when we when we read that is, OK, God, inf- God infuses grace because because, you know, in, in more popular discussions of it, you hear hear things like um, we believe in imputation, whereas the Catholics believe in infusion. Okay. And it's like, OK, so so how does this work if we have both? Right. Um, and so as I started to read more, um, it just became clear that both both are there in both systems, right? So there's there's imputation in the Catholic system and there's infusion in, in the Catholic system. So say ex- express it in a Catholic way, but yeah. as Calvinist as you can get in a Catholic way. Does that make sense? So that even the Calvinist can go, okay, so as a Catholic, you I can accept. You know, it comes this close to my view. How? What would the Catholic oh, view look oh, like? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, what the Catholic view is going to look like is it's going to flip the basis of of the legal imputation. Um, this is this is going to be very different. So, the basis of legal imputation is still Christ's death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. However, it's going to be because He infuses grace that He counts us righteous, right? Because grace is is um, a participation in the divine nature. Um, Calvinists are going to object to that all day long, um, and I think. There, I think that's very sad um, because when you look at um, scripture all over the place, we're called sons of God, right? And what does that mean when we back up? Um, you know, John, John one seventeen, he gave them the right to, to become children of God. Born, um, yeah, to them who, yeah, to them who received him, he gave them, he gave them the right to become children of God. Um, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when you back up and ask the question, "What is sonship?" I think that's really how we how we get here. What what is it to be a son? It's to share in the nature of the father or the one who begets, right? Okay. So, just as a just as a um, child shares in the flesh and blood of his father, right? So yeah. we are now begotten sons. We're begotten sons by grace, where Christ is the only begotten son by nature. So he okay. he eternally is begotten of the father, yeah. right? And so the, is, it, is it less legal, more familial? Is that? Yes. Um, it's, it's less legal. Um, well, you could put it that way, um, but it's more that it's more that what the adoption is and what grace is changes everything. Um, because in the, in the reform system, if grace is just a kind of a restoration of nature, mm-hmm. which is really what it is, nature is just, you know, what we possess by virtue of being human, right? Um, it's going to go all the way back to this debate in the garden. What is, who is Adam? What is his natural constitution? Right. So this is what ends up getting me suspended. Okay. Um, just, so, I, I want to still sum up the Catholic view. So you summed it up real nicely. And I know it's difficult whenever you sum things up, mm-hmm. as you say, this debate's mm-hmm. been happening for hundreds of years, mm-hmm. maybe longer. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to sum up. But what would you say of this? And I've heard Scott Hahn say this, right? We owed a debt we couldn't pay. So he paid a debt he didn't owe. Yes. That's something a Catholic can say. Mm-hmm. That's something a Catholic can absolutely say very easily. Yeah. Okay. So how does that differ from what you just shared about the Calvinist yeah, view? Sure. So in the, in the, yeah, this is this is this is the problem. Is it's just an immensely complicated discussion. So try to speak right into the mic. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So um, in the reform position, the legal imputation is the basis for the infusion of grace. Yep. Right. So uh, because we are counted righteous before God, then God, we're regenerated. Then we're regenerated. Yep. Whereas in the Catholic in the position, Catholic position, it's because grace is infused that we are counted righteous before okay. God. All right. So so now now. Now that's going to get into the question of what is grace and why for the Calvinist does grace not I see ca- why do, why are you not counted righteous on the basis of the grace that's infused I guess that's a All better right. way to clarify what I said before yeah fair enough um, and and, and I, I, maybe you didn't I, I don't want to kind of like nail yes. you to this point so we can talk about it for three hours it's just and it's as you say it's very complex I mean this is really I'm, the main thing so I think yeah. if, you, if if you work from here this is the main difference not only in this one area but when it when it comes to Mariology, intercession of the saints, okay. the infallibility of the church, everything is connected wow. on this point. Do you so, want to come back to this? That, or? that I, I think this the <laughs> theme of sanctifying grace is going to come up okay. everywhere. All right, so let's um, put a pin in that yes, then. Yeah, definitely sure. put a pin in that. That'll be back. So um, your dad converts to Calvinism yep. or is identifying as a Calvinist. Yes. And he shares this with you as a young child, presumably. Yes. And is it making more sense to you? Were you always a kind of intellectually engaged Christian or were you just um, doing what your parents did? Yes, I was. I was always thinking about what my dad was saying and kind of reading. I remember thinking that what he was saying about predestination at first was like, oh, this doesn't seem right. Like, how can I be predestined before the foundation of the world to believe? Doesn't that mean I'm not free? Um, And I had all these kind of like, like 
you know, questions about how that worked. And, but then my dad really just pointed it out in, in scripture, you know, you're, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. You know, you did not choose me. I chose you, right? All this, all these things everywhere. I'm just like, I can't, I can't mm. object to that. That's right there in the text. How old were you when um, you were going back and forth with your dad on this? I think 10 the first time we talked about <laughs> it's it. impressive. So 10 and then he gave me, yeah, he, I mean, my dad is just wonderful. He gave me um, several books by Puritans around that age. Um, they're not super hard to read. It's su- hmm. They're surprisingly... Straightforward. Um, straightforward, but very devotional. Hmm. Um, and I think that's something I could, I still love about them, you know, is uh, that was really my first taste of like, a, like more depth in theology. And then as I started reading more contemporary authors, I just felt like there was something missing. Um, and I think that's very accurate to this day that I just, just kept going back and finding, you know, from where we were, there's something missing here and there's something missing here until we end up, end up you know, basically climbing the ladder. Mm. and reaching back to St. Thomas Aquinas and, and others. So he's, you know, he's my patron saint. He's really the one I would credit for most of this. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, trying to explain the um, the depth of the, of the Reformed tradition is difficult. They have a lot, they've had, they have a lot of good stuff, right? I think most of it is um, excellent. I think they just go wrong on, on this point with grace. And that leads mm. off the path in several several directions. Um, and it's what's difficult about a discussion like this yeah. is it's a free flowing, yeah, laid back discussion, yeah. right? And you'll never be able to summarize the reform mm-hmm. position in a way that's exactly that's yeah. felt appropriate to those who might be watching from. Yes. but you certainly wish to do that, which I respect about. Oh, you. I would love to, and I, I'm yeah. planning to make other videos and stuff in the future. You know. Um, my friend Christian Wagner, I don't know if you've heard of him. of him. Yeah, uh, Scholastic Answers, I think is his YouTube channel. We're planning ah, yes. on going through. Yeah, he was expelled from school with me, same, okay. same school. Um, so there were three of us who got kicked out. There's 10 of us from there who have become Catholic. Wow. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been quite a <laughs> quite a ride. Well, before we get to you going to the school, can you just sort of like maybe fill in the rest of that chronology? So your dad is sharing these Puritan uh, authors with you. Presumably, you find yourself convicted mm-hmm. by the Calvinist system. Yeah, Can you sp- speak to that a little bit more, and then how that led to you going to this college. Yeah, so back then, I I, I was understanding it more as um, everything everything there was viewed through more of just a soteriological lens. So that's mm-hmm. just referring to salvation, right? Um, how 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 salvation occurs. Mm-hmm. So growing up and all the way through high school, um, I would get into arguments or discussions with people about uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism. Hmm. Like, um, like, you know, I was always a big Calvinist, so I'd have all kinds of texts prepared, just kind of talk to people about it. And um, I was just, I just love doing that because I just love to show, you know, God is sovereign in all things and um, he works, he works out his will as he does. And we freely cooperate in that. And this isn't, it's not like they actually eliminate free will in the Calvinist mm-hmm. system. That's something that that I think is very misunderstood as well. Um, Calvinists and Catholics actually on predestination are um, nearly identical sometimes. And then other times Calvinists take it a little too far and they, they fall under the anathemas of the council of orange and, and things like that. So Mm. there's some, there's some really interesting similarities. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've ever read Jimmy Aiken's article, a tiptoe through tulip. Oh no. Yeah. In that article, he seeks to show how, how close a Catholic can get to the Calvinist system without, I think heretic as we would think it all of them if you were to slightly change the sense if you change the sense now we're just equivocating and that's silly but at the same time like what they're trying to get at with um total depravity I think is is exactly what we're trying to affirm in original sin well not exactly it's it's it this is it it comes down to sanctifying grace again so Mm -hmm. because they don't see sanctifying grace as a participation in the divine nature or if they do they will say that some will, they don't see it as an elevation to something above the nature of man. Um, so it's just something that's restoring man's original mm. constitution in the garden, right? So for for a Catholic, original sin is, um, is the loss of sanctity. So um, original righteous, original justice or original righteousness in the garden is where Adam possesses both sanctity, so holiness before God, which makes his soul pleasing to God. Or as uh, Matthias Shabin puts it, he's my favorite theologian. Hmm. Um, grace is a um, 
grace is a, is a certain participation in the divine nature or a ray of divine beauty shed forth into the soul that makes the soul pleasing to God. Just absolutely beautiful. Um, I remember just reading that right after I became Catholic and I was just floored. Like, wow, that's oh. just wonderful. Um, but that's what that's what's missing. So they have it. There's sanctity, the holiness, what makes us pleasing before God. And then there's integrity, which which causes man's lower lower passions, things like that, to be in submission to his reason. Right. So when Adam sins, um, it's a mortal sin, and so that sanctity is gone. So just as the um, the way that we conceive of man, and this is, again, this is all kind of heady stuff, but um, the simplest way to put this is that just as the body lives in the soul, right, the soul gives life to the body, um, the Holy Spirit gives life to the soul, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is death for Adam in the garden because his soul is separated from God, and now he's tending towards the nothingness out of which he was made. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he ends up kind of just collapsing further and further into sin, right? And he dies within, this is another, a whole other topic, but he dies within, you know, the first day, both in a, um, both in the sense of uh, he died spiritually that day, but a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. He died at like 980 something, Interesting. right? So if you take that, uh, the, the book of Jubilees, we'll talk about that. And it, it, it's interpreted that way. That's a, there's a lot of debate on that book though. So I'm not really going to go into <laughs> a whole lot of it, but. Scott Hahn um, really likes that book. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. We've had some really good conversations about it. Um, yeah. Okay. So when you said you were in high school debating Arminianism, was Catholicism even on your radar? Not Did you know Catholics you were um, engaged in? What was your view of Catholicism or was it as remote as say like, you know, Coptic Christianity? Or? Um, not nearly as remote as Coptic Christianity. That's still pretty remote even as a Catholic, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I, anytime somebody tried to argue that Catholics were actually Christians, I would have said no. Mm-hmm. Um, no, they're not. They, they, they deny justification by faith alone. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so because they, they deny that you're saved by faith alone and works as part of that, um, there's no way because you can't be saved on the basis of your own merits. You're saved by grace alone through faith. Right. So would you presumably look at other Protestants as not Christian also? If they held, if they held similar, similar things, yeah, I would. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would have. Nope, nope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still, in a way, um, would. It depends on how you parse out the faith works question, mm-hmm. right? So um, that's kind of a big thing. Um, but yeah, at that time, very negative. Um, very negative towards Catholics, but not not so. It was more just kind of, this is what I know. This is what I've heard, you know. Um, there was always kind of a question there of how do they think about that? Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I always had questions from when I was like a little mm. kid about about like Catholic thought um, for some reason. Like, you know, I just remember reading all generations will call me blessed, right? And thinking, we don't really like bless Mary a whole lot. Um, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, mm-hmm. um, like, yeah, she's blessed. She gave birth to to God, right? Um, and I would have believed that. I would have been maybe less comfortable saying it then. But um, But we don't really like, yeah, we don't really think about it that way but it just felt like the world was a totally different world in a way than the world that you know um than the world of scripture like it just felt like everything has changed what happened here and i always remember thinking that growing up is like you have in the old testament all these blessings being passed down from father to son and like what is going on there can Mm -hmm. a father just bless a son i don't even you know yeah (laughs) so um yeah not not just the whole world the the tabernacle the 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 heavenly bodies being commanded by God to be fashioned. Right. Like, that seems weird for yeah. a Protestant, I'm sure. In a way, um, I thought, I always thought that was weird growing up. Um, I never really, I always just thought, you know, that's just a bunch of like legal Old Testament stuff and doesn't really have to do much with today. Mm. Find out that's dead wrong when I get to RBC and even Protestants, they're very good at typology. And um, that's mm. something that I think, um, they think Catholics maybe don't realize is that yeah. at least the Reformed tradition is excellent at that. Gerhardus Voss is, he's like the father of, reformed biblical theology so they do all kinds of the stuff like at the baptism of christ and how it relates to you know um the flood and then um the israelites going mm-hmm. through the red sea and um elijah um at mm-hmm. the at the jordan river and all these things like the same kind of stuff is just going to cool. be taken in a slightly different 
Well, not slightly. It's slight, but it's big <laughs> at once. Um, yeah, a deviation in the beginning yeah. leads to... Yes, yeah, exactly. Yep. So um, when you went to this Calvinist college, uh, what was your desire? What was your hope to do with whatever degree you were hoping to attain there? Sure. So I, um, <clears throat> I've always wanted to teach as either as a professor or in some capacity, I don't know. Um, around then was when I started to realize that I loved just reading scripture and understanding it and um, things like that. But I'd say one background kind of reason that I never really talked about, um, really with very many people at all was that I always had a struggle with knowing I was a Christian. Um, and now this makes sense to me, right? Um, then it didn't, uh, because in that system, it just, if you could put yourself in the mind of a Calvinist for a minute, um, you're, you're legally counted as righteous. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the basis of you living a holy life, mm -hmm. right? Not because the le not because the legal part causes that, but because there's the legal, and then there's the ontological or you know um, transformative aspect beneath it. Um, so if I see that trans that that transformative aspect or me living a holy life slipping, yeah, it doesn't cause you to question um, why am why am I slipping so much as it does? Was I ever justified to begin with? Um, and so when it comes to that question of assurance of salvation, um, the reformed claim, they can have an infallible assurance of salvation, like infallible logically and mm -hmm. uh, experientially, maybe not, but logically yeah. you can know because you can see, you can know if you're justified by faith, right? You trust. And that is an infallible thing. Um, but then I could see myself wondering, like, what does it mean to trust and how much am I trusting or yeah. am I even trusting? Yes. Yeah. So anytime I would fall into what I would call now a mortal sin uh, back then, mm. I wouldn't have thought of it in those terms, you know, struggle with like masturbation or something like that, mm -hmm. which, yeah, that was, that's, that was mind blowing to me when I found out that's mortal sin as, as I got older, you know, mm -hmm. when I, ju I just learned that like right after um, the teaching on baptism clicked. So at the time when I went to RBC, um, yeah, this is just this is just one of those like confirmations that Catholicism was the In right RBC, direction. Just one more time for those yeah, at home. Reformation Bible College. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is this is more this is further along, but I'm just going to skip here while we're on the topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was like I you know I'd struggled with with that kind of sin you know all the way through life you know mm -hmm. as most guys do, mm -hmm. um, but um, at at some point in there it clicked with me. Uh, that um, that's a mortal sin and that baptism, by baptism, uh, we can avoid all mortal sins, right? It's like, wow, um, by the grace of baptism, the Holy Spirit indwelling me, this is like the first moment I realized like in a concrete, like very real way, the Holy Spirit dwells within me and changes not only, you know, the way I feel interiorly, but how I can act exteriorly. And just from that moment on, it was like, it was like kind of this, it's hard to explain. It just never had a hold on me again. You know, it was just like gone from then on. Wow. Um, that was just one of those like just bizarre kind of confirmation moments of like this doctrine led me to get rid of sin that I'd been struggling with, you know, most mm. of my life. And it's like, wow, that's powerful. You know, um, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about this idea of this infallible assurance of our salvation. So like you, it sounded like you were saying when you would see yourself sliding into serious sin, it would cause you to wonder whether or not you were even a Christian, right? Yes. So yeah. what, what I want to know is what would somebody say in response to that? Like what does James White, who will undoubtedly watch this video, say in response to that? Yeah, so they're going to make it a, a distinction between objective and subjective assurance. So uh, assurance as to the object of faith. So when I'm trusting in Christ, who is the one who saves me, right? Versus me feeling like I'm saved. Um, so it's it's that objective assurance that's gonna gonna okay. matter. The subjective can go up and down based on how you live. Sure, I'm trying to think um, what a nice earthly or natural analogy might be. You know, like I don't know. I'm, try, I'm just thinking on the spot here. Maybe you're deathly allergic to something, mm -hmm. right? And then you start to feel sick. And you suspect that maybe you accidentally had that thing you're deathly allergic to and you become paranoid about that. But objectively, you know, you never took that thing. This is a bad analogy. Help me out. <laughs> no, that, that kind of that works. It's, um, 
Yeah, it's like you know. So it's regardless you know, of how you feel, something yes. has taken place, and that's what you put your dependence on, namely Christ and His yes, action, exactly. not how you feel. Yes, it's Christ's action exterior to you alone that saves. Um, that's I think that's that's a good way to put how reformed people think. But am I right in thinking that if a reformed individual apostatized, apostatized, I never get that right. Apostatized, apostatized. Uh, either way. All right. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, is it really? Yeah. Apostatized is how I would All say right. it, but I've heard Thank people you. say it before. All right. So somebody apostatizes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose at that point, his reformed brethren would say he was not actually a Christian to begin with. And we mm -hmm. now know that. Mm-hmm. But that would, and I'm sure there's a good response to this. So I'm not trying to straw man the position, but mm -hmm. that would terrify me because I'd be like, okay, so if maybe it wouldn't terrify me, but if there are people around me who leave the faith and I go, ah, they were never a Christian to begin with, but their subjective experience before that apostatizing was presumably identical to mine. How the hell do I know that I won't one day do that? That was my, that was my, I mean, I got into an, uh, not a, not an argument, kind of a discussion with my favorite professor at RBC about this in class, um, and this is my point with him, was like, if if anybody can just walk away at any point and then they just weren't saved to begin with, right, then like what what are we even, what are we doing? Like what are we talking about? Because I, I don't have an invaluable assurance objectively in that case because if I'm looking externally to myself, I can see that there are people who yeah. trick themselves. So. If I, if I think I objectively have faith, what if I'm just objectively tricking myself? Um, so you have this kind of like, what is going on? Yeah. And is that, um, in your estimation, like, is that a common sort of experience of? Oh, yeah. It is. Okay. Oh, yeah. All over the place. Um, yeah. That, because, that, because, I mean, mm. right now, it doesn't sound terribly different to me as a Catholic. Like, I have a moral assurance of mm -hmm. my salvation. Yes. Yep. Whenever I receive Eucharist, I'm stating I have a moral assurance yes, of my salvation. Yes, exactly. Right? Yep. Uh, and, and yet, I know that people, I've seen people who are deceiving themselves. Yes. We all know people who are like, this person thinks they're good, but they're really bad. Say, yeah, right? you're right. And you we, can see that And sometimes. you have to think, okay, well, if, that, if, uh, if I'm right about that assessment, it's true that I could be as deluded. Mm -hmm. So, I can't have an infallible assurance of my salvation, mm -hmm. at least for that one reason. Mm -hmm. But so all of a sudden, it sounds yeah. like the Calvinist and the Catholic are having a similar experience, but they're very, talking about it in different ways. Yes, very similar. Because um, what what we both came down to in that discussion with my professor was um, was you know the way you really have assurance is by living the Christian life, partaking of the sacraments, hearing the word preached, things like that. I mean, Catholics can answer the same way. And Aquinas um, in the Summa talks about this. He exactly. talks about like whether yeah. if we despise the world, love heavenly things, that these are signs of our salvation. Yeah, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of messy interpretation of of like the anathemas at Trent against. Um, I believe there's an anathema at Trent talking about the assurance of salvation that somebody knows for That's certain right. that they are one of the elect. Right. right. Um, so for for the Calvinists, they're going to say we can. Yes. Um, for but Augustine as, and for and for Catholics, you're going to say no. I can't know for certain unless there's some kind of right. Um, and that's what Ludwig, Ludwig Ott in the Fundamentals of Catholic yes. Dogma points out: is yeah. the Council of Trent never said one cannot have a moral assurance of mm -hmm. our salvation. Presumably, we ought to have that. Yes. But. So I think I think that's that's kind of the kind of what's difficult is um, this is one thing I've been finding. I've I've been reading um, On Divine Revelation by um, Father Gary Lagrange. I just worked through both volumes actually and mm. there, there's a whole section here where he talks about how um i forget whether he says it's at the time of the reformation but i think you can see this happening around the time of the reformation either way um forgive me if i'm if i'm straw man and calvinist here um i don't i'm really not trying to this is just kind of my sort of hypothesis somebody critique me if i'm wrong um but the um it's that the speculative intellect which is what knows things in themselves mm -hmm. um so it's like i can know this water bottle in itself tends to get weakened or at least not distinguished enough from the practical intellect, which looks at things in accordance with their use. Mm -hmm. um, and so you end up having a lot of arguments in, in Calvinist theology from the from the practical intellect or moral arguments, things like that, from like a lower kind of reasoning, but not enough kind of speculative um, thought. And by speculative, I don't mean um, like, oh, we're just going like to fly off bowling. into the clouds. Yeah, no, yeah, I yeah. mean like, yeah, I mean knowing the thing in itself in a very concrete way. Um, it, this goes back to the, the discussion in the garden again, too. Um, they, they just will simply say, um, for Adam, he, that is, Adam is naturally made in holiness, right? And so Adam is holy by nature, uh, basically. Um, it's not looking at it, breaking it down and abstracting 
um, yeah, Adam is one person. We're not going to disagree with that. Historically, there's one reality in that Adam is, you know, one holy man who is made, right? He's made in holiness. The question is, what makes him holy? And so um, the Reformed are going to reject. Well, they're not going to reject. At least the Reformed I was talking to at RBC, um, our professors would reject most likely um, the idea that grace is an accident which inheres in the soul. Um, so an accident is that is something that follows upon a substance, whereas a substance is what makes a thing what it is, so in itself. So Adam substantially is a man, right? And when he has grace, he's now a graced man, right? Mm-hmm. But if Adam doesn't have grace, he's still a man, right? Um, this is this is kind of the thing. So mm-hmm. I think what had, ends up happening there is the language just isn't clear enough um, in in most in most of the Reformed tradition, at least contemporarily. Um, in the past, I can find positions where they very much will say grace is an accident that inheres in the soul. They just don't see it the same, quite the same way. Um, they're not going to call it a super added grace that comes from above. That's a whole theoretical discussion. We don't have to go into that. But um, this this leads to from the beginning the differences in how we set up how we view salvation history, which which changes how we view our entire soteriology, the entire economy of the covenants. Um, everything kind of hinges on that point of what is man and what is like, how does this all work together? Um, how, do you mind me asking how that conversation was resolved with your university professor about wondering whether or not you're a Christian? Because you said that that was a discussion you got into. How did that resolve? Oh, yeah. back to assurance? Yeah. Sorry yeah. to um, jump back. No, no, there. no, you're okay. Um, yeah, that was resolved, I think, with us both agreeing on the fact that we just have to... Um, have the have the sacraments think about these kind of kinds of things right um and just live and the sacraments for the calvinist mean I mean baptism and w- eucharist it's called sometimes but the lord's supper mm-hmm. is is the general way it's spoken of um whole that's really a <laughs> whole another big discussion but that's that's a um that's one of the main things that really ended up converting me was was recognizing the the sacraments um because when i went when i went to rbc those were Many of the questions I had too was like, what are the sacraments? I remember a conversation with my dad about um, how the sacraments are called means of grace. Like I found that in one of the Puritans or something. And my dad was like, you know, I don't really know what we mean by that when we say means of grace. Um, He's like, I I, I do believe they give grace in some way. Um, But what that means, um, I don't really know. And that just kind of left me like, huh, that is really odd. And my dad's dad's position on the sacraments is going to be a lot different than what what the Calvinists at, at RBC are going to hold. So his was more just like, um, baptism is just a sign, right? And um, communion, as we would call it growing up, was also just a symbol, right? Just like crackers and grape juice, and you remember Jesus. Um, are, is this the view among old Calvinists? I no, didn't think it was. No, right. not at all. Right. Um, so this is, this, is the, this is the view sort of taken by Zwingli. Um, it's going to be yeah. referred to as... Um, Zwinglianism, it's a little more nuanced than that, I think, even in Zwingli. But um, this might be good, actually, to help clarify the Calvinist position or yes. one of them to our Catholics who mm-hmm. keep straw manning how yes. Calvinists view sacraments. Yes. yes. So explain, explain to me how Calvinists often view the Eucharist and say baptismal regeneration even. Yes. Okay. <laughs> baptismal regeneration discussion is, um, let's start there <laughs> and then we'll go to the other one. Uh, so I don't know whether my RBC professors are going to agree with me on how to interpret baptism regeneration in the Reformed tradition. Um, Because I think there are a few people who have brought up this position and they weren't. um, I don't know how seriously their their position was taken or or anything like that, but it's kind of a difficult, kind of a difficult thing. All of these are. Um, So I would say it, it ranges from, yeah, I'll give a range of what the Calvinists will, will affirm on it. Um, at the lowest point, and these are this is where the kind of Calvinist I was, being kind of a Presbyterian, um, more looking to the historical reform tradition, I would say this is heretical. Um, even from that from that position, is that it's just a sign. Mm-hmm. Um, now, th- the difference is the the Calvinists are going to say there's a sign, and it's, it's a sign and seal of God's covenant. So just like you have um, circumcision is a seal of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith, right? So it's a seal. Now, when you really get into the definition of seal, it's like, 
I don't know that this is a whole lot different than being a sign pointing to something else, but it helps confirm in the mind, at least to some degree, um, that God has promised that I will um, inherit salvation, right? So it's you're in the church, which is the which is the um, visible church in the, in the Presbyterian church. System. So Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists are going to differ massively. I'm very familiar with both of the arguments because I was a Reformed Baptist and then I became a Presbyterian. Um, that's a big debate about the nature of the church. And this is what the, the debate about baptism, I think, really centers on is <laughs> the structure of the covenants in Scripture and how these things relate to each other. So the Baptist is going to see a, a discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New. Um, so will they'll, we're they'll see that um, infants were circumcised in the Old Testament. And so while in the Old Testament there were infants as part of the covenant, the new covenant is a substantially different thing. Um, so it is, um, as they would put it, one, one covenant progressively revealed, formally established. So it's, it's, it's revealed through time what the new covenant is through the other covenants, namely. Um, and then it's established with Christ coming in, in, in the new covenant but the new covenant changes things to some degree where it's only those who explicitly mm -hmm. believe by faith that are part of the covenant. The Presbyterians are going to go the other way, and this is what's going to lead to infant baptism, is they'll see a fundamental continuity with the old. Um, so infants are circumcised in the Old Testament. They're entered into the covenant. Why on earth would, would suddenly all of these infants just be excluded in the new mm -hmm. um, like we have no statements on this so we have to assume continuity yeah and work from there and i think the presbyterians are right on that issue um now i th i do think at the same time they're holding baptism regeneration because the church is or not not, bas not not baptism regeneration i'm sorry um <laughs> holding um infant baptism because that's what the church had always done so there's there's something you can see there as well um but th what 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 it gets into with with the sacramental positions both in Reformed Baptists and in Reformed Presbyterians, is on the highest end, you're going to see people holding that baptism does regenerate. Mm -hmm. For the elect. Through, yes, for the elect. Um, <clears throat> not at the time of the administration of the sacrament, but when they have faith. Hmm. Um, so this is this is in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I think the Reformed Baptist Confession, uh, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, is very vague. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly. They kind of left it more open. Um, I don't know why, but mm. I don't know the history there at all. But um, so, yeah, so it will regenerate through the sign. The question, there's going to be questions in several, several theologians, like um, I think it's Cornelius Burgess. He's a Westminster divine, wrote a book called The Baptismal Regeneration of Elect Infants. Mm. And I came across that and was like, whoa, okay. So the Westminster Confession being a consensus document means there's, it's a consensus document, meaning that there's um, all kinds of positions held uh, by different different theologians there and they're trying to come together to form one mm. you know ecclesial body mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and so you have you have anglicans in there you have presbyterians in there it's, more, it's a presbyterian government but um you have people in the church of england that were there because the church of england is moving in a in a presbyterian direction at that time is okay. kind of the idea that's really vague um but <laughs> i don't have time to go into that and i don't know it well enough frankly okay. so um and and just real quick, if you can, the view of Eucharist. In, Eucharist. This, yeah, this this is what. And again, there's a spectrum, but yes. How did you view it at this college? How was it viewed at that college? Yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a spectrum again from um, just a symbol to um, to this position, which I think is is right um, for the Calvinist. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Is that it's um, our professor put it as. Um, where the where the Catholics will will take the will take Aristotle and say it's transubstantiated, so the form mm -hmm. is in the thing. Um, we're going to take Plato, so it's up in heaven. Mm. Um, so the the sacrament is a participation in the body and blood of Christ on mm. earth. You could put it that way, but it's more that it's more that we're elevated into heaven when we partake of mm. of the sacrament. Um, so you really do share in the body and blood of Christ, just not in a substantial mm -hmm. way and. While that sounds pretty close, and a lot of Catholics would maybe just be like, that's not really all that bad, <laughs> it completely misses the point. Um, the point is that Christ took on flesh to give us his life through mm -hmm. his flesh, and so his His flesh and blood are life-giving, and so we have to partake of him, the person there in his flesh and blood, of his nature, so our nature can be renewed 
by by the Holy Spirit who's given to us through Him. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think that's what's that's what's missed. Um, is it's it's really very fundamental when you when you take what's in um, Eucharistic theology and apply it to just incarnational theology. Anything that happens in the Eucharist is happening in the incarnation. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a a picture of what's happening there. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that's just not something that's really reflected on a whole lot, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. So when did Catholicism begin to enter your orbit or you begin to enter its? Like, how mm. did you encounter Catholic writers? What even made you interested in in reading them? It's, I, I think to myself, you know, like, suppose I became a Mormon, let's say. Yeah. It's like, I don't know if Catholicism was as much a stretch for you as Mormonism, but for me, I'd be like, gosh, how would I even begin to enter that orbit? Mm-hmm. I would either have to have questions that can't be answered by my own tradition, and then I hear over there that the Mormons are answering it, mm-hmm. or maybe I'm attracted for some other reason. Mm-hmm. What was it about Catholicism? Mm. Yeah. So this is, there's like a million things at once again, too. This is, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I knew this was going to be difficult, but... Coming in, it was coming into RBC, I'd say it, the whole thing built and kind of culminated in my conversion, I would say. Um, so it was like recognizing for one that the church isn't just little bodies of believers, right? Separated and with their pastors as their governors. Um, there's actually a body that's supposed to be together. And so when I realized that it's completely incoherent to even think about scripture, right? You know, the letter to the Galatians, letter to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're writing to people who are in unity with each other, who are supposed to strive with one mind and one heart, you know, towards the goal of eternal life. Right. And so it's like, okay, that, that just doesn't even, um, that doesn't even make sense now if we have all these separate, separate bodies, what's, what's going on. Um, it's spoken of as a body, which means it's visible, right? So I needed some kind of concept of a visible church, right? So there's a visible community of believers. Um, the reformed offer that, right. And so, um, that was part of seeing infant baptism make sense too, was recognizing the Baptists have a different ecclesiology because they have a different, Mm. um, because they have a different understanding of the covenant, which is going to change the way governance occurs. All of it is so connected down to the finest thing. And I, that didn't click with me until around the time that Catholicism started to really like make sense in my mind. So I'd say starting there, um, seeing the connection to covenants rather than some kind of a kind of dispensationalism um, that I held before, which is just it's a different position. There's a reason um, Baptists end up the way they do is they see the they see scripture split up into different dispensations, which aren't necessarily re- related to each other. Mm-hmm. But there's several kinds of dispensationalism, and that's just too big of a discussion again. Too, I don't want to go into that. Um, it's not fun either. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so that was that was a big thing. Seeing seeing the sacraments is starting to make sense, just starting to move, you know, ever so slightly closer. So is your is your mindset and view of scripture moving closer to Catholicism without you yet realizing that Catholicism is the thing you're moving yep. closer to? Yep. I never would have even thought. Yeah. Um, I recognize that this makes sense. Um, but it was like I'm I'm more thinking about what's biblical. Mm. What like what is scripture saying? How do I best interpret scripture? Um you cannot avoid the idea of a of a visible church, and this is what I got into arguments with several of my friends about. You know, infant baptism, things like this. We discussed it all the time. Um, that's like the thing you discuss as an RBC freshman. It's like a rite of passage, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, that's that's what we always. It always came down to that, and I just landed on that that position because I think it makes so much sense of what's going on in the Old Testament and. Leading, leading into the new, right? Mm-hmm. Is that it's an actual body of people. Um, now, the way that that works, mm-hmm. the way that that works is going to be totally different from from one to the other. So when you switch ecclesiology, the the, the difference between the, the soteriology um, and the ecclesiology is what gets us there, is that um, for the Catholic, every baptized person is regenerate um, unless they put up some kind mm-hmm. of block yeah. Um, and are just like obviously not, you know, wanting to accept grace, right? Then mm-hmm. it re- then it would only regenerate if they were to um, repent and turn to grace. Right. Um, so the example would be someone being forcibly baptized as an adult who yes. doesn't wish to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in that case, 
in that in that case, that's that's the only reason somebody wouldn't receive regeneration. In the reform view, though, anybody who falls away who's baptized didn't receive regeneration, right? And so now, what does that do to the to the church, right? Mm. So if you look at baptism that way, now everybody is united to gra- united to Christ by grace by sharing in His life through the sacraments, right? Because mm-hmm. um, as Saint Leo put it for the Catholic, you know, what was once visible in our Redeemer has passed over into the sacraments. So by sharing in the sacraments, we share in the life of God um, through the hum- through, through the humanity of Christ, which is given to us in the sacraments under various forms um, as different participations in his ministry. For the reformed, they're just more, they're, they're visible, the sacraments are visible preaching of the gospel, right? So it preaches the gospel in a visible way. Um, so it's not a sharing in the life of Christ as much as it is a, a picture of what's going on. Um, that's going to change the way the church is viewed. Like I said, I'm just trying to make sure that these these dots are connected, so I'm not just speaking disconnected from anything. You know, um, that's going to way that change the way the church is viewed because the visible church now for the Calvinist is going to be, um, the visible body of believers. But then the invisible church is going to be those who are united to Christ actually and really by faith, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's. Wow, I'm realizing that that's going to sound almost exactly the same as a as a Catholic, but it, we mean very different things. So when somebody's in the visible church, it means they have or had grace mm-hmm. as a Catholic. Mm-hmm. It doesn't for the Reformed. So if you're in the invisible church, you've certainly been justified, and you're certainly going to heaven. For the Catholic, that's not the case. Um, it's if you're if you're brought into if you're brought into grace, you have to persevere to the end in that grace because grace is like the seed of glory. It grows up into eternal life, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, the verse, the 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 rivers of living water flowing from from the believer, right? If you think of it, think of it that way, Jesus words to the woman at the well. I know I'm quoting the verses all off. I read in like a bunch of different translations, so I screw it up every time. But um, but yeah, that's that's where. It changes things a lot is seeing the two two different positions there, um, and seeing seeing the visible ecclesiology, um, the much more like strict visible church in in, in Catholic teaching, um, was was a result of the sacramentology. I wouldn't have been able mm-hmm, to recognize mm-hmm. how that made sense without without seeing sacramentology. Okay. So, yeah. So visible that's part of it. visible church was there other things that you were beginning to accept that were more, uh, um. Yeah, visible church. I'd say I'd say accepting things like like the sacraments actually conferring grace in some yeah. some way, um, like accepting Calvin's view of 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 the Lord's Supper. Um, and did that get you in trouble at the Calvinist school? No, no. Oh, no so what was it that began to get you in hot water there? Yeah, what what started at started it there was um, hmm, was really. Uh, well, it, it was that that started moving me more explicitly, mm-hmm. I'd say. So when I, when I would talk with our professor um, in, in Theology of the Reformation specifically, um, was the class we were in. Me, my, my friend Michael Hall, who also converted. I think you met him the other day, actually. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and my brother Liam, we were reading through all the Eucharistic debates because our, our okay. professor has been reading through them for like, for like 20 years and studying through them. Cause he just, he loves studying that stuff. Mm. Um, he's just very passionate about the, the reformed view of the, of the Lord's supper. So, um, we were reading through those and, and it just struck us that how similar transubstantiation is, um, to the other position. And we're like, that's really not that weird of a position, you know, um, like it kind of makes sense. Um, and we already were, well, I'd say we started reading Aristotle a little later, um, but at that time we were thinking about 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 that. How, for one, that that's interesting. Um, we see the language of the fathers always talking about how it is the body and blood of Christ, and our professors right to say, in a way that they don't really define strictly speaking what that means. Mm-hmm. Now, I think you do see it really clearly sometimes, like Cyril of Alexandria, um, who says to Nestorius that. Um, that if if Jesus is not God, we eat the flesh of a mere man. Um, so it's like we're cannibals practically. We're not eating yeah. the God man. What's the point? And so it's like that is something more than just a more than just kind of a mystical figurative thing. language. A, yeah, there's a real kind of eating, mm. um, which they're going to they're going to agree with the language of real presence. Um, they're not going to agree with 
transubstantiation specifically. Okay. Um, so you got to be really careful with the language there. But um, So as you and your friends at this Calvinist college are maybe becoming more open to the Catholic view of transubstantiation and a visible church, uh, at that point, are you trying to incorporate these understandings into your Calvinism? Or are yes. you thinking we have to... Be- the Catholicism is looking more likely. Yeah, no, um, I, yeah. I would not have considered the Catholic Church as, um, for one, even when we started reading St. Thomas and I recognized. Um, you were just like, right, he got I this one right. This stuff. He got this stuff right, mm. I think. Um, then the question, seeing that was like, okay, the Reformed positions are are either wrong or these are maybe synthesizable. I don't <clears> know. <throat> um, or... I, like I didn't really know where I was. I mean, I, are you and your of, friends looking? I like I know you weren't really looking at other Catholic authors, but were your friends who you were meeting with to discuss these things looking at Rome? Um, one of them was. Okay. One of them was. He, um, Michael Hall, um, who we met the other day. He was. He read through Saint Thomas, Thomas's Prima Pars, uh, his like first or second year in, in Doctrine of God, because mm-hmm. there's all kinds of things in 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 that um, area in Reformed theology where there's a bunch of people who start to question. Um, I can't say the word immutability mm-hmm. um, and things like that start to move in more of an open theist mm. or something like that kind of direction. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's very much opposed to reform theology. Our professors mm-hmm. know that we're very clear in teaching that. Um, and so that they, you know, the, as, as my professor would say, they just, you know, basically copied and pasted Thomas's doctrine of God, you know, just like the stuff's great. Yep. Run with it. You know, um, so he read that and then he started reading. He's he's much more into philosophy than theology. And so he always just kind of had this like suspicion. He was like, you know, they seem to just think a lot more about these kinds of things. Um, those were the things I heard then. Okay. I thought he was nuts. Um, I was like, you're absolutely insane. Like, you're dumb. What's wrong with you? You know, um, like I actually said that to him one time. Cool. How did, how did, um, how did he respond to that? <laughs> um, he was like, okay, man. And just kind of like moved on. It's like, okay, man. Um, whatever. You know, I was, I was being very stubborn. Um, I don't want to truncate your story, but can we get to the point where you started getting into hot water? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is where, yeah, the sacraments change things. Um, and then... I guess as we really started looking at this more, we were like, okay, we need to, I need to like see what a mass looks like. And one of my friends was going okay, but to- So why, can you get a bit closer to the mic there? Yeah. yeah. Why, why are you even looking at mass? Okay. That's what I asked my question. Okay. Why, why isn't it just, as yeah, you yeah, said, this is, this synthesizable? Is so when I, okay. if I, if I started being attracted to Calvinism, yeah. just practically speaking, I always, I always am just so um, in awe of converts yeah. because I can't imagine how disrupted my life would become yeah. if I converted. Yeah, like I, no, I was that's, the same that's way. a real practical issue yeah. that has to be addressed. And so, if if I was being drawn into kind of Calvinist thought, the very first thing I would do is try to synthesize it. I certainly yes. would not be looking that's, to become a Calvinist at least right away. Yes. So yes. that's that's what we did. Um, when you said hot water, I immediately thought of getting kicked out of school. Well, that, so sorry, that is what I, I was meant, thinking. I guess. That yeah. is what you meant. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so so yeah, that would require skipping a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, going back, what I, I guess when I really started to see these things, it was it was questions, right? How can we try to synthesize these positions? Because if there's something we can do there, yeah, um, so that, that would require that would mean you not having to go look at a Catholic yes. mass. I, I I wouldn't have I would not have wanted to at the time still. Okay. Um, if we're if we're here in the timeline, <laughs> right? Sure. So I guess it's hard because we're jumping around. Yeah. Um, staying in one place, it. I I guess when I started to recognize. Here, it started. It started here. Um, I was driving back. I was engaged at the time. Um, we it didn't end up working out. Catholicism, several other things. Um, but um, I remember driving home one day, and she just looked at me and was like, "You have no attention span. What is wrong with you? Why can you not pay any attention?" And I was like, ah, "How dare you!" you know, like, I like I didn't say that, you know. But then I went upstairs. You're and an sat idiot down. too. Yeah, <laughs> just I, accusing everybody. <laughs> yeah, I went upstairs and sat down on my desk and was like. Oh, she's totally right. I have no attention span. I've just been playing Call of Duty Warzone all summer. All summer and <laughs> Which was <you> know, awesome. <laughs> absolutely awesome. Warzone 2 is fun too. Um, but, should um, be a Catholic version where you run around just forcibly baptizing the people you're about to kill. <laughs> oh all right, sorry, keep going. Anyways. Which wouldn't take effect uh, anyway. Um, um, I just you remember sitting the there. Old, uh, Louis the Ninth. The What's best that? way to deal with a heretic. Is to what? Is, is to run it's my sword run. through his innards. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Came across that quote pretty early. Loved it. All right. I so you had, no, you had no attention um, span. I had no attention span and I was just not not living life well, <laughs> as we go off know? on a thousand different yes. contingents. Anyway, this, you have this, no attention this, span. This, 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 this will bring us back. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I just remember sitting there being like, wow, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not focused on anything at all. I'm supposed to be getting married in a few months, things like that. I really just got to like pray like repent and just do my homework right and because of where i was kind of at from earlier my homework was writing like several papers in st thomas because i was because it, it led me to the questions of what's going on at the reformation um why why are all these things kind of looking the way they are i need to understand catholic thought before i can understand reform thought um in a certain way right because it's it's we're arguing against them and i can't understand our arguments unless I understand their positions. And I'm, I'm assuming the reformers understand Catholic positions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, from then on, I just like sat down, started reading and got to work and then realized like a week later as like baptismal regeneration and a few other things started to like really click in place. And I was like, whoa, this is like, like life as I know it at this moment is like over, <laughs> you know? Um, once I saw baptismal regeneration, it was like, there's no, there's no synthesizing. Um, once you have that position, um, actually, actually down. There's no way because I was looking at it from the lens of the infusion of grace and things like that before. And didn't get to the means of the infusion of grace, which mm -hmm. was baptismal regeneration, and so that changes things gigantically. Um, so once once I saw that, it was like, that's ah, yeah. Um, I'm at least not not. Uh, I can't hold the reformed doctrine of justification anymore. Um, I think right. It was like this is my general inclination, so I'm going to try to live as if the Catholic way of viewing things is true. Right. So wow. not at this point, do you know Catholics? No, this is a way I'm so impressed by people like you and Dr. Han, people who it's not like they were being convinced or strong armed or it's not like it would have been convenient if you'd become a Catholic because all of your friends and girlfriend are Catholic. It's yeah, the exact they didn't opposite. Even go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was awful. Yeah. Um, mm. Awful. Very weird time. Um, Did that then so when you realized that the Catholic view of baptismal regeneration was correct, did you immediately go, yeah, yeah, fine, but they're definitely wrong about mm -hmm. Mariology, Pretty much. contraception, yeah, all these other so. things, and therefore yeah. I don't have to be too afraid? I didn't, no, I didn't, I, I did kind of the other. It was like, they were right on this, transubstantiation is not as alien as I thought. This requires further further research. I can't just kind of step back but i okay. also have to recognize that i see baptism regeneration um this makes a lot of sense to me F from scripture uh, makes a lot of sense to me from from the perspective of the church fathers mm -hmm. right um it was mostly augustine that made it click when i was reading augustine on perseverance for class um uh me my brother and uh christian wagner um we all were kind of like okay so we receive in baptism grace and then um, God gives us the gift of perseverance. Only those who God is predestined to receive the gift of perseverance will receive it and actually persevere to the end. So that's a pure grace, right? So if somebody falls falls along the way, they were still a Christian because they still had grace and were united to Christ, but they fell away. And I'm like, that makes more sense of the assurance issue. Beautiful. I love that. Um, what do we do with baptism itself? And what do we think about, um, about how this works with assurance? And they're realizing from then on that is... That's Augustinianism. As Calvinists, we would have claimed we were Augustinians, right? And we are in the sense we would have been in the sense that um, we held predestination um, and things like that. But and so we stayed in that tradition. But misses on the sacraments, and it's like clear what's going on there. Um, so now, is that a works-based righteousness? Is the question that pops into your mind? Is you know, mm -hmm. if it's baptism, is that a first of all? Yeah, this is an earlier step too. There's so much to go into, but it, w one of the biggest things was seeing that the sacraments are not so much works I do mm -hmm. as works God is doing um, or as things God's using to work in me. Mm -hmm. um, so it's God who does it. So that the whole Donatist controversy, we studied that in one of our classes. Um, yeah, trying to put this in a coherent order is <laughs> is massively hard. I try thought about how to how to do this before beforehand, and I was just like, you know, I'm just gonna kind of kind of got just gotta roll with it and yeah. see what can happen. Yeah. But. There's just so many different beautiful things all at once. Um, when did you first read a Catholic other than the saints? Um, was it not during this period of your searching? 
I read, I mean, I'd read, I'd, hmm, what Catholics did I read? I'm trying to Because I would think if I was being drawn into the Catholic Church from outside, I'd want to be like, what are people saying today? It was basically inconceivable to me at the time that that, that, it's, that okay. Rome that Rome. Okay, yeah. so it's still inconceivable. Fair yeah. enough. So why would yeah. you bother reading them? Right. Yeah. yeah. So at, at that time, at that time, it was just Saint Thomas and taking Saint Thomas and thinking about Scripture. Okay. And then relating that to Sola Scriptura and things like that. That broke my mind when I saw that. Um, was Sola Scriptura <laughs> like if I can interpret Scripture? This is like traumatic, you know, like it's <laughs> let's like, do it. it's like, all right, let's, oh let's my just, gosh, let's brush aside all the other topics we've been talking <laughs> yes. about. Let's stay here yes. for a moment. What broke your mind? Um, I just, <laughs> just recognizing that St. Thomas, um, St. Thomas's view of scripture, um, of baptism, of, of, of communion, of several things worked coherently. Um, just like th on the other hand, I could in coherently interpret scripture through a Calvinist lens. Mm -hmm. um, that just like, I was like, how is that even possible? Right. I don't um, understand. Because I mean, Aquinas doesn't address Sola Scriptura. No, he doesn't. So um, what's, what about what his coherence broke your mind? Okay. Um, for me, as an, as an individual, my mind was broken by the fact that there are several systems of thought that I can, that I can hold and look at scripture through different lenses and have them make sense yes um <laughs> that just made me go like what right. how can i like how 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 is practically speaking how are we ever supposed to have a unified church right um, because if if that's possible like w how who's it, to the, decide the coherence yeah. alone isn't what justifies no, me holding yeah. this view it has to correspond to what's real like yes. is god really regenerating me when i'm baptized or is he not it's sort like, of like uh, in pulp fiction whatever that golden thing is in the box i don't know if you ever watched it <laughs> a long time ago i wouldn't recommend watching it there's like you could come up with a host of different things like it's never explained mm -hmm. it could be elvis's gold suit it could be whatever so all of those things might be coherent mm-hmm but the coherence isn't enough to prove the thing real. Mm -hmm. That's what broke mm -hmm. your mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, I. I mean, I already knew to some degree that that was the case. I just didn't think that scripture. I could actually read scripture in two different ways and have it come out that way. And ah. so that was my first like. So your thought was, if I read it wrong, then things will start contradicting. Mm -hmm. You didn't realize you could start from many different points and make all the things cohere. Mm -hmm. Am I getting it right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It because it really depends. You you're gonna. Calvinists hmm. are going to say all the time, scripture interprets scripture, right? Yes. You take, you take fundamental points and you interpret scripture with scripture. But um, when, when you get, come up with multiple coherent systems, yeah, what's what the, interprets the right yeah, interpretation? Wh what's a clear passage and what's an ambiguous passage? I mean, like, how do I determine that? Because what's a clear passage to a Catholic and what's a clear passage to a Protestant are going to be different things. Gotcha. And then we have different definitions of words, like faith. Um, we have different definitions of, you know, like when you have a word that, that's that important and it's yeah. defined in a fundamental mentally different way um which for them it's more just it's like believing the th for the calvinist that is i've, I've realized i've gone all over the place because no, this is helpful like for me crisis, this bit, it feels like we're getting down to um, a bit of a nub yes so when you have words like faith and it's like you know it's uh, historical belief that you know the incarnation things like that happened belief in the in the revealed teachings right and you trust right that's the way that they define it whereas the catholic is going to define faith as an intellectual assent, assent to to that god teaches this thing on the basis of certain signs mm -hmm. so we're going to see um you know miracles happening and then christ speaking and say okay because of that miracle christ's words i believe are true because mm -hmm. he just showed that he's divine not human or well he's divine and human but you know what i mean mm -hmm. um, it's succeeding the powers of human nature um and and all created nature, um, but that that led led me to just be like, we don't have like a definition book that came with scripture. You know? mm -hmm. Like, how am I supposed to? Um, I can never work through all this myself. There's no way. Um, there, there's like in a certain way, there's no point in trying. But that was the moment that faith, faith and faith, hope and charity started to make so much more sense to me, like concretely. Although I couldn't define them well. Um, I just remember thinking, you know, I have to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him and just continue on, right? I can't just mm. stop or I will become hopeless and I'll just 
die, you know, like I'll just like lose it, you know. So when you brought um, this up to your friends and professors, what was the response? Um, I can't remember a specific conversation where I talked about this um, at the moment. Um, I'm sure okay. there was. So, but... so this is what's always kind of confused me when I, well, I'll hear a Protestant say that Catholics really oversimplify and misrepresent what sola scriptura means. They do. It doesn't mean sola scriptura. It means reading it within the tradition. And mm -hmm. we also have these different professions which mm -hmm. guide us, right? Mm -hmm. But that's never seemed satisfactory to me because presumably if a confession was at odds with how I'm interpreting scripture, why do I have to go with the confession that isn't infallible and inerrant? Mm -hmm. Well... It's, Why, be, it's yeah. because the elders of your church have come together and agreed that this yeah. th this is how we should interpret scripture, and so it's it's you're not trusting in some kind of divine yes. Well, that's my reason. Point. Yeah, right. So, but why can't you're, they be you're wrong? You're trusting in human reason. They can. Yeah, um, they can. Uh, it's just the question of whether they are. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, practically speaking, um, and this was another thing that I realized as well was that practically speaking, the Westminster Confession is is used as if it's infallible, right? Um, in some ways. Now, you have exceptions that are made to the Westminster Confession of what you can hold on doctrine and things like that. But it comes down to it, if somebody's denying the Westminster Confession of Faith um, and they're holding something that they believe is scriptural and you have to excommunicate them, it's going to be on the basis of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Wow. Right? Um, and so, like, you see that. And so that's how you interpret scripture. How yeah. do you, how does this, like, practically speaking, is there a big difference? Um, yeah. It, from that angle, no. From other angles, Yes, um, it seems because, to be, yeah, yeah, because if the teaching, if the teaching of the Catholic Church or the teaching of the Church in general is completely irreformable, unchangeable, um, what, like, what are what are our words? You know, like, are our words signifying divine realities that are unchangeable, or are they not? And so, so this is a debate even in the Reformed world. I think um, is that you have you have people like John Frame who argue that Calvin was right to argue against Cyril's interpretation of Christology, for example. Mm. It's like what are you thinking? You know, like that is nuts. And I thought that as a reformed person too, like, no, that's like the council of Ephesus is, you know, like all over the place, you know, that you cannot just question these, these, um, these creeds and confessions that way. Like this, this is a very clear statement of Christology, right? And it's very, very obviously biblical. Um, and so how can we go there? But the, the ground of it is scripture, right? So it, it seems to communicate to me that our words, like what we say, does cannot fully represent not I don't even mean fully I mean just substantially represent something that's above us mm. um, so it's, it comes down to faith and reason again I mm. think the the role of the speculative intellect but I'm speculating not in the sense of speculative intellect right now um so I don't want to go too far but that's just my general kind of thought is that it's a um it's just the it's it's an epistemological sort of sorry can I ask a clarifying question about that because it see it didn't are you saying that they accept that you need outside authority to interpret scripture like we do, but then they deny that it's infallible? Um, I just, I, that's what I heard, but I'm sure that's not correct. Well, it seems to be a concession to the Catholics that says we're going to need something in addition to scripture so that we can be faithful to what God has revealed. So we yeah. can actually know it. Well, the problem, it just seems like, like on a practical level, it just seems like an awful idea to say I need an authority and the authority is not infallible because then it seems that you're saying that the interpretation yeah, no. can be infallible, which in practice makes the way makes scripture for you infallible because the way you're reading it, therefore, is through a fallible lens. If that yeah, makes sense. No, it's it's that's, that's why that's, that's why I had to ask because I, it's, I, yeah, I see I see what you're saying. No, they're they're gonna say that the the the, the creeds and things like that they're not infallible in themselves. Um. They're going to say like the Nicene Creed is inerrant, but they're going to say because it aligns with how scripture is teaching. Yeah. Right. So this is merely human teaching. Yeah. Um, but that is, those are divine. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the word of God, right? Is scripture, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's how God actually speaks. It's a fully divine and fully human book or truly divine and truly human book. And then it's truly the Holy Spirit who's the author who truly writes through men. Right. Um, but they're going to, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to say that the church is a human institution. Right. And so I think, I mean, I've never explicitly heard somebody say that. Um, say what? This, that it's, that it's a, just a, it's a human institution. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, I think it's somewhat assumed that the Holy Spirit is not guiding in such a way that there's going to be 
no errors, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to assume there's going to be errors mm-hmm. and that there's that it, things are going to have to work out through time, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, they, they're not going to see, um, they're not going to say it's infallible on the basis of the creeds or something like that. Right. No. Okay. So, so, sorry, but, I just wanted but, to ask because the way I heard it, I was like, surely they do not actually think what I just no, understood. No, but on, on the other hand, they are going to have some kind of outside authority in just human reason. Um, well, some of them, uh, most of them, uh, if unless you go like a whack kind of route, um, human reason has its own kind of authority because God endowed human reason with the ability to know things, mm-hmm. right? And so it's not like you can just pick up scripture and then just like read it without having any kind of outside knowledge of like what a tree is. You know, mm-hmm. you can just read tree in here and suddenly know what a tree is. That's not how it works. Like human reason has to take in things before mm-hmm. you can read the text of scripture. So in that sense, human reason becomes an authority, but um, there's no like strict institutional authority the way we're thinking of it. So tell me the first time you got into trouble. <laughs> um, what happened? And then back up from there and tell me what it was that got you in trouble. Yes. So um, a few friends um, went into went into the school and were just worried about us. Um, when I went and talked to them after, that's what they said. Um is they were just concerned that we were heading in that direction. They wanted to make sure we were talking with professors and things like that. I had been, I'd already been talking with, um, I, my reaction was right away. I'm going to go talk to the professors. I, I don't, this is too big of a risk. This is like, this affects everybody in my life. Like if God came to earth and told us this is what baptism means and we got it wrong, we kind of got a big problem on our hands. Um, so, so yeah, so I was just very open, but they, they, yeah, they went to the professors and we got an email Um, We got an email back asking us to come in and discuss our commitment to the doctrinal standard as put in the student handbook. Um, So we're like, okay. Um, And um, me, Michael Hall, um, Christian Wagner, and my brother were all called in. Um, At the time, like I said, I was practically holding justification um, in in the Catholic sense, right? So where it's an infusion of grace, the, the renewal of the interior man is the basis of the legal imputation. Um, the doctrinal statement, they, they, I think they emailed it to us or something before we went in. And when we went in for that first meeting, they asked us kind of what we thought of it. Um, and so there were only two, two professors, the professor who I'd been talking to the whole time. And um, he was like the, the student head at the time, I think. Um, he's like a student pastor, I believe. Um, and they, they kind of, just asked me questions about the paper. And I was like, I, you know, um, I can affirm, I can affirm the words here. Like I can affirm that justification happens on the basis of a legal imputation, but I know what you mean. And I don't mean that. Mm. Um, they asked about the sacraments. And I was like, I don't agree with you on the sacraments either. No, um, there's really no way I can agree with you on that right now. Um, I could be convinced otherwise, um, but I, like, I can't see it here. Um, and, I forget exactly where I was, but I remember somebody asking me about like, so what are you thinking about going to Rome? And my answer was like, I just saw a video the other day of Pope Francis talking to a little kid and how the little kid, um, the little kid's dad, who was an atheist is going to go to heaven. And that is just like out there, you know? Um, And there's, there's, you know, that's what I have to say at the moment. I don't know. You know, Um, this is, it's a lot, a lot to think about. Um, And so... So after that, my my other three, the other three went in as well, um, and then we came back in. So you weren't a few together days later. as you were being questioned. No, okay. the questions one by one. Um, so then they brought us in the next few days. All the meetings were like half an hour apart, you know. And it was like it was like Liam would meet with them, then Christian would meet with them, then Michael would meet with them, and then I would meet with them. And the fact that they put me last was a general indication to me. I knew the other three had said they could agree with the doctrinal statement, mm. so Liam at the time could. Um, Michael could as well. Um, but Michael was also like questioning the entire notion of who are you to ask me what my private thought is, right? Um, I don't, I'm not sure that that's something that's like normal to do is question like what I'm thinking interiorly. Right. Like, like trying to proselytize other students. Right, we're these. just thinking through this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he was much more quiet about it than me. I was out there like, I have to ask questions because I need to know, right? And I can't just sit here. Um, so he he was in the last semester of his senior year. Um, so he he didn't end up getting suspended or anything. Um, Christian, when they came in for that second meeting, they questioned him more, um, <laughs> and he he ended up getting himself expelled. 
Um, and then, and then for me, how, how did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, if anybody knows Christian, he is, he's very intense. Right. Um, and so, uh, I love him to death, you know, and it's, it's like my, it's like my favorite quality of his, it's his best and his worst quality at once. Um, but he, he, he goes in and there just started asking him questions about like the sacraments. Like, so you believe seven sacraments as an Anglican? And he's like, well, yeah, but like there's two of the gospel and there's five of the church. And these are not the same kind of sacraments as the two of the gospel. That's like a really niche, weird Ang Anglican position. I'm sure we could find videos of him talking about it. Um, I never really got into the Anglican world very much. Um, but he, um, <laughs> he, he, he was like, no, I, I very much hold what I'm, I'm within your, your tradition, right? I'm, I'm reformed. I'm not a Catholic. And they're like, you're a Catholic. If you're holding positions like, he's like, I'm not a Catholic. And, and somebody, he said, he said, one of them looked at him and said, you are a Romanist. And he's like, I'm not a Romanist. I like, I'm not <laughs> like, like, what are you saying right now? And, um, and they're like, no, you are like, you're just, you're not, you're, you're not being honest. You're kind of like slipping around. And I could see how it could look that way, you know. Um, that's clearly that's really not what he was doing. Um, but I could see from outside how, if you're affirming seven sacraments, you can look that way, right? Yeah. Um, then he um, they asked him questions about like the apocryphal texts and things like that. Like, what what do you think of those? And he's like, I think they could be read in the liturgy. I don't think they're necessarily infallible. Um, this is at least my memory of it. I could be wrong. The Deuterocanonicals. Um, he's referring to yes, yes yeah. yeah. Um, and um and they were like no no and he's like then i deny your opinion with the church catholic <laughs> and it was like <laughs> whoa <laughs> and so yeah, he got called back in and expelled um in my meeting um my meeting was yeah uh so one of the weirdest kind of memories i have was they they called us in and there was like i think there was four well there's four people in the room so like the president of the school the academic dean somebody who was recording the like what was going on and then like the pastor um and they they kind of talked with me and said you know we're gonna have to suspend you until you can grant our statement of faith um we would love to still talk with you through these things um mm. but yeah since you, due to your own admission that you can't grant it at least in the same sense and thank you for not equivocating or something like that um we're gonna have to suspend you until until then um, that seems that seems like a reasonable response yeah right it, it, it was i think it was the fact that they ways. were willing to discuss with you until you could hold those views they didn't just sort of banish you yeah right i don't i don't i don't really have any um <clears throat> any qualms with the way they handled it um i think i think maybe if they had um asked me more questions i would have appreciated it you know mm -hmm. um but um, i had already been talking with dr math uh, i don't want to name anybody no, not shaven oh yeah. i see i um, picked you up yep okay. um yes um with one of the professors there ah. um and um and we'd we talked through a lot of this stuff they knew that um i don't think there's a great danger in naming him but um it uh yeah they so, so so they they knew kind of that i was talking with people about it maybe that's why they didn't feel inclined to ask um a ton of questions but it felt to me just very very odd the way that it, it went, you know, mm -hmm. um, like it just happened very quickly. And um, I, I did appreciate the way it was handled, you know, um, the academic dean, um, very loving and kind man. I met with him several times afterwards and we had just, just some wonderful conversations. But he uh, he said in there, you know, um, this is really for you in a way like this is a crisis. You need time to process this. Um, it's like true. I do. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, they said, you know, we started kind of hearing bubbling up among the students. And I was like, did, did I cause that? You know, I really didn't mean to um, cause a gigantic, you know, um, thing among the students. This was not at all my goal. And he's like, no, no. And we just kind of heard things going on. And we just really wanted to check in with you guys and make sure you're still, you know, holding our statement of faith. And the president of the school kind of looked over and was like, you, know, you actually care about what, how, what's going on with the students. And I was like, I do. I mean, I really, like, this is a, a big thing. You know, like, this is the gospel we're talking about. And he was like, he was like, yeah. And then he's like, you're a good man. And that was like the best compliment I ever got, you know, was while being suspended. Um, <laughs> hearing that, it was a really weird kind of moment. But mm. um, yeah, it's been complicated since then. I haven't had my credits transfer to another school or anything yet. So I'm still trying to figure that out. But mm. um, from, the, from there is when... Um, how did you get in touch with Dr. Han? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, this is where it gets fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that guy, we'll, we'll call him Scott. 
Hey, I want to say thank you to the greatest prayer and meditation app in the history of prayer and meditation apps. You know what I'm talking about. Hallo, as in H-A-L-L-O-W. Check this out. They've got sleep stories. You can learn how to pray the rosary. They have audio books. Um, they have my lo-fi, incidentally, but check this out. You can even let Dr. Scott Hahn put you to sleep <laughs> at night. Not because he'll come over to your house and strangle you. That'd be weird, <laughs> although for the right price. Check this out. Good evening. Oh, come on. And welcome to tonight's Bible story. Do you hear the rain in the background? My name is Dr. Scott Hahn. You will not be able to listen to the first three minutes or pass the first three minutes because you will fall asleep. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. The reason you should go over there and sign up as opposed to downloading it on Apple is twofold. Number one, you get three months for free and you get access to the entire app. So if after three months you don't like it, you can just cancel. The second reason is you don't give any of your money to Apple. And, you know, why give more money to them when you can give it to Hello? Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Also, go <laughs> hello.com slash Matt. Go check them out so they know that I sent you. Second thing I want to tell. Let's put it back. It's good and it's clear. And do Martin. Second thing I want to do is tell you to become a supporter over on mattfrad.locals.com. The reason I migrated from Patreon over to Locals is Locals is a free speech community that's not going to ban me for kicking against secular dogma. When you go over to mattfrad.locals.com and become a supporter, here's some of the things that you get. You get morning coffee podcasts with yours truly. You get access to a very energetic online community. What's cool about Locals is not just me posting and you responding. You as a local get to post yourself and engage an amazing Catholic community. Community, you'll get, if you become an annual supporter over at mattfrad.locals.com, quarterly newspapers. That's right. I am in the newspaper business and it's costing me way too much money, but that's okay. Read all about it. It looks really good, actually, these newspapers. There's Catholic comics and articles and poetry. And a Sudoku. A Sudoku. Sometimes two Sudokus. And anyway, we mail it to your door, even if you live in Yemen, New Zealand, <laughs> or anywhere, Not really. the moon. We, we don't mail it to the moon. We don't mail it to the moon, but we do pay for shipping uh, if you become an annual supporter. You'll also get access to bonus interviews that we do that we don't release on YouTube. You'll get monthly audio books. You'll get online courses. We have Dr. Ed Fazer leading an exclusive course on the five ways. Dr. Chad Englund leading a course on Augustine's Confessions. You get there's so much that I give you. For example, we have weekly comedy sketches now from Australian comedian and Catholic James McCann. James Donald Forbes McCann of the James Donald Forbes McCann Catamaran <laughs> Plan Podcast. <laughs> it's really cool. So go sign up over there, please, and you'll get the full pints with Aquinas uh, experience, and you will ensure that Thursday will continue to be paid. <laughs> please sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Mafrad.locals.com Back to the show. Go. Yeah, this is. I'd say this is where it gets fun because we have. Um, I I had. Um, I just been suspended. Liam was not, um, and I was like, "What on earth do I do?" I just you know got suspended from school. My parents are not very happy. You know, understandably. Um, we can talk about my parents' reaction later, but um, you know, they're understandably not very happy. I don't know what to do because I'm in my I'm in my um, last semester of my junior year maybe technically a senior by credits. I, I forget exactly how it works. Um, but um, I just need to figure out what I can do with school. And so I sent an email to Franciscan, which I only did that because um, I think when I was looking this morning at my email from Father Gregory Pine, he'd recommended. Okay, we could go him. back to that yeah. maybe. Well, let's go back there first. Yeah, because yeah, um, I, I want to know who the first Catholic was you reached yes. out to. So it was, it was Father Pine. How, um, how did you do that? It, Liam and I were... <laughs> Yeah, the whole story with Father Pine is crazy. Um, won't be too long, um, but it's well it's wor well worth telling. Uh, Liam and I were were canvassing um, out on um, out for like a political candidate in Florida, and um, this is just what our job was at the times. So we just drive around and and talk theology and stuff like this. And I think one day we just had the question: What actually do Catholics say like today about faith? Mm. and works and this is probably even before i granted baptismal regeneration and this is probably like really really close at the beginning um it was like you know we're like what what do they say and we look it up and find a video by brent petrie and he just uses all like completely scriptural language and i was like yeah like scripture does only say faith alone one time and it's where it says not by faith alone but that doesn't mean that justification by faith alone is wrong you know that's just 
Um, that's just, it's just different context from James to Romans. Right. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about it that way. Um, but it, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that led us to finding Father Pine on the, on the, on the Thomistic Institute. And so we watched a few of his things and we're just like, wow, he's just going from like cookies to like the Trinity. Um, <laughs> and, and the way he's connecting these things is just glorious. And he's speaking with such like beauty and elegance and um also with like authority you know like he's saying this is what baptism is this is what baptism does and immediately the text popped into my mind in scripture you know he speaks as one with authority and not as their scribes mm. and i just remember thinking that's similar to you know because every time we talk about the sacraments in, in the reformed world it's like well there's this position there's this position there's this position there's yeah. this position and these are all within our you know boundary but Whereas, you know, you hear Father Pine talking, baptism is this, and this is this, and this is this, and it builds this hmm. beautiful thing. And and just the way he would go from like the existential to um to just the just the mysteries of the faith just in seconds and seamlessly show the connection between the Trinity to the incarnation, to sanctifying grace, to us, to just like living the Christian life. And I was just like, this is just stunning. Um and I don't know, you know, it's it's beautiful, but I don't want to get just get caught up in words. He also seems to know what's going on. Thomists seem to be pretty in, intense. So at least if there's Catholics that are good, um, we should reach out to them and see if maybe we can synthesize stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I sent Father Pine this really long email. I just read it this morning, actually. <laughs> you know, and uh, and I was like, if, well, I, I think I emailed them. I was like, can I get Father Pine's email? They sent it back and we're like, yeah, sure. And so I emailed him and was like. Okay, so I have all these things. We, it was everything we talked about regarding, you know, faith, hope, and love. We didn't mention that, but, mm. you know, that's what sanctifying grace is in its created aspect. It's faith, hope, and love. And so um, and so that's that was like, okay, justification by the infusion of faith, hope, and love versus by imputation and all these things. And I kind of summarized all that, and Father Pine was like, whoa, seems like you have a pretty good idea of what's going on there. Um, let me just suggest that you read the treatise on grace by St. Thomas. So these questions in the Summa to these questions in the Summa. I was like, sweet. So we sat down and read those and just realized that Catholics are by no means semi-Pelagians. And this is what we always thought thought as Calvinists, yeah. right? Is that Catholics <clears throat> taught that it's like, you know, it's God who works. And then we kind of like complete God's work in a way. But no, it's like God works 100% in us. And then we 100% work out what, what God does. So as Garagou Lagrange would put it, it's where there are causes in two different genera of um, causality. So there, God is the primary cause, right? And we are the secondary cause. So just as it rains, when it rains outside, God gave us rain today, mm -hmm. right? Um, we could say that, but we can also say the cloud caused it to rain today mm -hmm. and the, the whole you know precipitation system and all this stuff. Um, God uses the secondary cause by effectually moving it to do that. And it's like, beautiful. Um, so now our salvation, in the, it, recognizing the Catholic view, salvation is a truly divine and a truly human act. Um, so it's truly divine in that God's the one who works it through human agents. And so the human agent is a real second cause mm. that God is assisting and moving to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. That was something that I think the Calvinistic position has to some degree, but I'd say they're, they would more emphasize that it's all God, none man, right? When so this was something that really balanced it for me was seeing that like wow, that's there's some, there's beauty there, you know. Um, and Father Pine and I, we had tons of emails back and forth. Um, we got on several video calls. Um, I emailed him when I before I got called into um, mm. into the <clears throat> office thing, and he was like, "Oh man, I'll be praying for you. That's quite a struggle." and we just kind of talked through this stuff and tried to, yeah, he, he gave really good advice a lot. You know, he was like, really just like, you're not ahead on a stick, you know, take your time. Like you're a human being with like a life and you gotta like just breathe and kind of think through these things. You know, the Lord understands where you're at and he's working with you. And, um, yeah, I mean, Father Pine is wonderful. I just, and then finding you guys, it was so funny. Liam and I driving around, um, hearing you guys like, gush about mary you know and we're like these catholics you know like they're, they're they're so great on some stuff and then they just gush about mary how how she's like the you know the ladder down whom god descends like what does that even mean that's ridiculous and then as we start to think about it more it's like no wait like god actually came through mary it's like kind of like that so we kind of think of her as a ladder from heaven to earth hmm. so the language actually kind of does make sense in a secondary kind of way whereas 
it's not like idolatry, you know, it's just really poetic flowery language we probably wouldn't use, you know, and that, that started this whole thing on just like the sense of our language, right? How we use our language and how this leads to different positions. Father Pine just really showed us things there. Um, just recommended books, Charles Jornet, a few other guys. We did read Catholics. Jornet, mm -hmm. I read him on the mass. Um, I read St. Robert Bellarmine a lot, but there was, those are saints, you know, but those mm -hmm. are Catholic saints, right? Just like very yeah, much yeah. not. Whereas St. Thomas were like, maybe he was Catholic, maybe he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Don't really know. He was back then. <laughs> he but, was pretty sure. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty sure. And I'm pretty sure now, but <laughs> but back then, yeah, you know, I wasn't. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was... So that was pretty so then, incredible. Okay, so when did you get in touch with Scott and how did that yes. happen? Yes, so that was after I emailed Franciscan and was like, <laughs> I need help. I'm stuck. Um, and why Franciscan? Why did you look I to Franciscan? I think it was because Father Pine recommended it. I knew it was a close one and I was thinking okay. of school options. Yeah. I think I knew Dr. Han was yep. up there. Father Pine went to Franciscan. So Yeah, yeah. He recommended that. He recommended several of the Thomistic ones around and... Um, I knew Dr. Han was there, but I didn't really know much about Dr. Han. I just knew he was a convert from Presbyterianism. So I think I put in there at the bottom or something like, I know Dr. Han was a Presbyterian convert. If there's anything you can do to help, I would love to hear about it. You know, um, I didn't even know really who he was, yeah, um, like yeah. I said. But later that week, that weekend, I get a text, you know, hey, Ethan, it's Dr. Han. I'm in, he I'm is in, I'm the in Florida. Bomb. He's so great. <laughs> yeah, he's so. He's, he does that with everybody. He does. He's, he's just, just wonderful with it's, that. It's almost like he, tr I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but from the outside, it looks like he is a man who believes that it is God's mission for him to bring in every Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> and so he just smells blood and goes in, but in the most respectful, beautiful yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he... <laughs> Yeah, he 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 texted and said, you know, like we can call. Um, but I I am in Florida right now. I just wow. happen to be in in Palm Palm Beach, Palm Bay, Palm Bay. Um, and um, and if you if you'd like to come down or something, and we're like, yes, I'd, I'd love to come down. <laughs> we would I'd, love I'd, that. I'd, yes, that is. I don't accurate. know. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't. I mean, and then Liam. This is the. Uh, this is one of these moments where this is just like a, another kind of confirmation sign moment, you know, where it's like, this is clear divine providence. Um, Liam is stuck working at a pizza hut and, and I really want him to come with me. Right. I'm like, I don't, I, I gotta go and talk to this guy. I can already who, guess what happened. Who, who, who I barely know. Yeah. <laughs> he quit his job. Uh, no. On the spot. No. Ah, no. That would have been um, so cool. Yeah. It would have been cool. <laughs> what did he do? Didn't happen that way. Um, he was, yeah, he was stuck working there. He'd already taken a few days off. I went out front of the pizza hut and was like, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to talk to his boss and just let him know, like, we're talking to somebody. He may not have another chance, hmm. you know, um, this is kind of a really important thing for us, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I was like, you know, we just started granting intercession to the saints, like, maybe three weeks or a month ago. I'm going to pray Litany of the Saints first and just oh. kind of wait. And Liam will call me, right? So I call him. Or so I, so, so I, I pray the Litany of the Saints and just sitting in the parking lot. And I'm just kind of waiting. the pizza place? Yeah, the okay. pizza place. I'm just kind of waiting. And, um, and I'm like... Liam's going to call me like, there's no way God's just going to like, you know, allow me to go meet this guy alone. Like, I don't know who he is. You could just be some like big jerk, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's so funny to say now, <laughs> but, um, but like, I have no idea what's going on. And, uh, and so I, I pray through that and sit there and I'm like, Hmm, yeah, nothing, nothing. Liam hasn't called me. Let me just, uh, let me just go inside and maybe, you know, secondary causes, like we were talking about a minute ago, maybe I'm supposed to be the secondary cause to kind of, you know, that's how God's going to work to answer the prayer. Right. Mm -hmm. So just go inside and talk to them. And they're like, no, he can't. Like we, <laughs> we got to keep him. And I'm like, I'm like, come on. Like that's, uh, I'm like, Liam, you can't figure out something else out. Like, why don't you just leave? He's like, no, I can't. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm going to go back outside. I went back outside and prayed a second litany of the saints. And I'm like, I'm waiting. It's going to happen. <laughs> and so then I was like, Waited a few minutes, didn't happen. I was like, okay, I'm going back in. And so I went back in again. I was like, Liam, can you come? <laughs> he's like, he's like, I I can't, dude. You're, you're going to just have to leave if it hits like this time. I mean, I was like, why don't you call your other boss? Because you said something about your other boss not being in or something. And he's like, okay, I can, I can do that. And he calls the other boss and the other boss is like, no, we need you here. <laughs> um, and Liam's like, dang it. Okay. So he, I got to stay here. And I'm See, like, if you had like, went oh. directly to Jesus Christ without usurping <laughs> his authority by going through these middlemen. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. I know. Well, That's then, a joke. Then, That's <laughs> a joke. <laughs> <laughs> then, I, then I went out and, um, then I went out and Liam was like, if it hits like, 
I, f- I forget what time it was, like 11.15, for example. You just got to leave. And I was like... Because you'll be late. Yeah. He's like, you're, you're not going to make it. Um, you just got to go. And I was like, mm, fine. Man, I just sat out there and I was like, I'm praying one more Litany of the Saints. <laughs> and like halfway through this Litany of the Saints, I get a call. Lee, uh, Ethan, Ethan, the, my boss just came in feeling super guilty. She just said, Let's just go, just go and worry about, make up the hours later. And, and Liam comes running out and we're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what just happened? And I was like, dude, I was just praying Litany of the Saints. And he's like, he's like, no way. And I was like, yes. And he's like, what? And we're like all hyped driving back to his apartment so we can grab his, grab his stuff. And um, uh. he goes... He goes running inside where everybody, all of our friends are hanging out in there because, you know, this is like prime time. We're doing all kinds of research, like books stacked like six feet high, you know, um, and we're just like, this is this is crazy. And they're, they're all like, what are you doing back? And he's like, the saints, the saints are praying for me. And, and he just grabs his jacket and like runs out and everyone's like, okay, what the heck just happened? Um, and so... That was just one of those, one of those, one of the most fun moments right there. Um, and as we're as we're driving down, we're like, you know, we should we should pray through the rosary together. We've not prayed through it yet. Wow, um, that's intense. And so yeah, we prayed through um, you know all twenty mysteries for the first time. And it was a two and a half hour drive. For some reason, it took us the entire two and a half hours to do it. I think we stopped and ate some pop tarts or something along the way. But but uh, oh yeah, we did. We definitely did. Like the cinnamon pop tarts, mm. the best. Oh, it's so good. Eat them um, but, while you have a metabolism. <laughs> so were you not afraid of offending God as you were praying to Mary? Uh, well, I, we didn't even get to... This was earlier that I dealt with that, right? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. We can talk about that experience right. if you'd like, but, um, right. but there's plenty of reactions mm-hmm. to Protestants who, who sure. came around to that, you know. I was at first, but... Um, after realizing, you know, she's... just Why couldn't... Well, yeah, well, actually, we'll go back to that because it involves, it, it involves Christian Wagner. And it's a, actually another really kind of notable mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we can we can deal with that. Sure. Um, after, but but here, um, well, let's not lose the momentum. Yes. Yes. Protestants <laughs> in cars, getting coffee, going to see Scott Hahn. <laughs> yes. Um, so this was the first the first Friday in in the first Lent, I think, that we'd ever like thought about doing. So we're like, oh, we can't eat meat. Interesting. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do, like keep Lent. We get there and we're like, let's grab some food. Oh wait, it's it's Friday in Lent. We gotta get like fish. Yeah. Oh. And so we got like a McDonald's filet of fish or something. <laughs> They're like, okay, well, we're going to go meet Dr. Han now at this random parish. And we, we walk in and there's Eucharistic adoration going on. Never seen Eucharistic adoration before. Yeah, that's weird. I was Keep like, going. I was like, okay, <laughs> what is going on? The, the Eucharist is just here. I'm just going to like, you know, sit down and kneel. Like, I do believe it's Christ. I, um, at this point, but I'm trying to figure out like what, I'm, what is going on here? This is really odd, you know? And so I was like, this is the moments where it's like the idolatry bells are going off. Like, am I worshiping bread? And it's like, mm, no, if like, you know, this is not just bread. It's the body and blood of Christ. Right. And so I'm sitting there like, this is odd. I can't really do much, but I just was overcome, overwhelmed by this, like, like, like there's just this burning feeling you kind of get. I feel like this happened several times where it's like, you're just like stirred to love of love of God in a way, you know? Um, and that would happen like every time we came across some kind of really like notable truth. It just really like you just like struck by something, you know, and that was one of those moments where I was like, this is something different. I don't know. Yeah, this is very serious, but I can't stay for more than like three or five minutes. This just feels too, too much for me. And so Liam and I left and I think that's when we went to go get the filet of fish. We showed up, found the place and we went and grabbed that and came back. And um yeah, we met Dr. Han. Um, had he just given a talk or something? Yeah, he was giving a talk. Um, he was giving a talk. They did like reserved seats for us up at the front, and we we're like, "Whoa, weird." Um, I never had that happen before. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, but he gave a talk, and it was just wonderful. First time I ever heard him speak. Um, and it was really kind of a confirmation that the stuff we were reading um, is practically applied at least somewhere. Yeah, I and mean, it was like, "Wow, this is uh, this is pretty incredible." And uh, we talked with him after, after, you know, a whole bunch of people went up to t- try to talk to him and um, he talked with them for a little bit and then was like, I really got to go talk to these guys. Like they came down here for this and um, yeah, we sat down and started talking. He just asked us a few questions about like what we were reading, wh- what school we were going to, things like that. Um, and we answered him and he was like, Reformation Bible College, that's founded by R.C. Sproul. And I was like, yes, R.C. Sproul. And he's like, R.C. Sproul was my mentor. You know, um, John Gerstner and R.C. Sproul, I learned so much under them. I'm so thankful for them. Um, they, you know, they helped me see like the truth in, in many ways, you know, and I think um, we just like really connected from that moment. You know, it was just a 
a lot of um, a lot of the same stuff we were looking at that brought us into the church in some ways, and um, and so it was great. But he just he asked us. Um, well, the first thing he said that just really stuck out at me was like, "You're so you're reformed. You'll never stop believing in." in uh, predestination he's like you'll, you'll always hold it i hold it even stronger now than i did before you know i'm like really he's like yep yeah, you'll see it very experientially i think in life or something like that and i remember thinking like that's i'm glad because that's one of the big things for me that i just could not mm-hmm. like i like looking at scripture there's no way you can avoid it um and um and then he asked he's like so uh, so like where how much have you guys like studied what do you you know have you prayed the rosary yet you know, and we were like, yeah, we just prayed through all 20, uh, <laughs> all 20 of the, I don't even remember what they're called, the, the things, you know? And he was like, he's like, oh, the mysteries. Yeah. And we're like, he's like, wow, you prayed through all 20 mysteries. And we're like, yes. And he's like, oh, I got to go get you guys books. And he just <laughs> he go, got up and ran off and grabbed us like a whole stack of books. And, um, and Liam and I are like, wow, this is, this is really cool. And we talked to him about all kinds of things. I mentioned our mentioned one of our professors and he's like, Oh, he's brilliant. I love his books. You know, um, he's like, I disagree with him, but I love his books. And he's such a great scholar, so much, a much better scholar than I'll ever be. And we're like, wow, those are some high words. And, um, (laughs) and, um, how important was it that this man that you're meeting is seeing the good in the things that you saw good in? Very, you know, I think that is important as we try Mm -hmm. to kind of evangelize. Mm -hmm. It's like, as opposed to being judgmental and pointing at what's so bad and wrong about this or that tradition, there's so much mm-hmm. good to be found everywhere. And mm-hmm. he already said, R.C. Sproul, mm-hmm. this professor, uh, yeah. meeting you where he can with predestination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was so much, <clears throat> so much there. I mean, I was just talking with him about this last night, how it's really like Protestantism is talking with Dr. Han about it last night. Um, I live with Dr. Han. That's that's why but for viewers don't <laughs> we'll have, have that to context. fill in that gap in a yeah. sec. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're, we're talking about that, how really um, everything that, 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 that is taught that's really good in Protestantism is first found in Catholicism. Um, but it's, it, it points back to it too, you know, like you, you get back to Catholic thought and it's elevated and raised beyond itself by what Catholic thought mm. is doing you know um it is, there's just such a beauty in that and that there's there is good everywhere i wouldn't have converted for example without having um vatican ii's lumen gentium mm. um frankly like there's there's sections of it where i'm like okay that's kind of ambiguous i don't know how mm-hmm. to interpret that you know but um but without seeing grace operable outside the visible boundaries of the catholic church yeah there's no way I ever would have been able to look at the Catholic church and be like, that makes sense. You know, yeah. it just, it would be completely incoherent mm. um, to say that. So it, so you and Liam driving back, what was that experience like? Um, what, how was Liam re- reacting to the conversation? You know, I hardly remember the drive back. Um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe in the future we have Liam come too. Was there still <laughs> a lot to think through after you chatted with him? Or was there even oh, yeah. more to think through? But did you was... have more of a direction of where to go? I mean, given that he'd given you all these books? and Not at the time. Um, yeah, we read a few of the books. I read, um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm forgetting the name of the book. but Is okay. it his? Yeah, one of his. Um, the one on Revelation Oh, um, of the New Covenant is, um, what is that called? Everyone's screaming at watching at the video right now. Yeah, I know. What is that called? It's not the Lamb's Supper. Yes, it yeah, is. Yes, that's the Lamb's Supper. Good job. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That's the one. Um, <laughs> Crushing it. Um, read, read that and, um, and yeah, just giving, giving an interpretation of revelation through liturgy um, was something beautiful, you know, just recognizing <laughs> that. Um, our, one of our professors <laughs> had already presented something similar Um but not quite to the same degree as Dr. Hahn calling the new covenant, the, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist, right? Recognizing that is like, okay, that's a really big yeah. thing. Um, so yeah, that, that helped. But I'd say by this point we were, we were um, in some ways I was like, I'm pretty much ready to become Catholic, but I also have a kind of, um, I don't know, you know, I see, I see the system make sense. It's coherent. It's beautiful. I've seen actual effects in my life from from viewing these things, like I mentioned earlier with sin, right? And then, um, but does it actually correspond to reality? Infallibility yeah. is a really, really big claim 
right? Um, really big. And so it took, it took a long time for, for me to just come to, to, to think about it and, and come to agreement with that. Um, in a very like experiential and real way, you know, like I could in my head, like, okay, it makes sense. But to look at the Catholic church as it is now, you know, Pope Francis, things like that, that was a struggle to some degree, but it helped me clarify papal theology and well, not papal theology, you know what I mean? Papal mm -hmm. doctrine, things mm -hmm. like that. And, um, yeah, those were, those are some hard, um, some hard questions. I mean, um, my, my professor, he, he, uh, he did a lot of interaction with the guys that called to communion for like years. He just mm -hmm. will barely interact with Catholics anymore. So this is one of the hardest things is mm -hmm. that even with, even with where I was going, he was like, mm, I think you're just, you're too far out. There's no way you're going to be able to hold another position. You're practically holding that the Catholic, Roman Catholic church is true. There's no way I can, mm -hmm. there's not even a point in having this conversation in a way. Um, we should have had this conversation earlier. And I was like, but I don't, I don't, I still don't share his opinion on that. Um, I really don't. I think, I think he views the Catholic church. He, th I feel like he sees uh, the way we view the Catholic church and just equates it to the way we view scripture in a way, maybe not, I could be wrong. Um, but that's kind of the general impression I've got from our tons of emails, mm -hmm. um, where the Catholic church is really the application of revelation to people. So the faith exists, um, above and before in a, in a certain respect. Um, logically speaking, like the, you know, the Catholic church is the one who preaches the doctrine, right? The apostles are part of the church, right? Mm -hmm. So, so scripture comes from the church in that sense, in that God uses the, the apostles to write the text of scripture, but it's really the word of God speaking in them and mm -hmm. the word of God who speaks and moves in the church, right? Cause he dwells within the church. The Holy Spirit's the soul of the church, just as he is the soul of, of an individual Christian. Um, and I think th that distinction isn't made clear enough that the, that the the church is applying revelation to to the people, to individuals, and to you know communities, mm -hmm. and it's not like it determines the 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 uh, deposit of faith, which is external, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that's yeah, that's something that's um, not clarified well. I think in in a lot of contemporary Catholic theology that leads to leads to some confusion uh, with Protestants. You had mentioned that some of Pope Francis's actions had at least were potentially stumbling blocks to union with Rome. Talk about that because I imagine that's true of a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say too much, um, but there's, tr there's real like scandal, I think caused by um, some of the actions and words um, that he said, but at the same time, I think people don't quite understand the, uh, the the teaching of the church on the fact that popes can err, just not when they're speaking ex, ex cathedra or they're not binding the church to to believe something. Um, and so, seeing that for me, it was not really all that big of a problem once I recognized that, um, and I recognized that very early on. Um, so it was it was a worry in the sense that. Um, if this is happening um, frequently and all the time throughout history, for example, if it's everywhere, right, that we just have these awful popes who just, you know, I don't want to say happen to not err, right? Um, <laughs> this is looking at it as, as a Protestant, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at it from outside, like they just happen to not be wrong on Catholic doctrine when they're speaking in this in particular circumstance, right? Um, that's maybe a general sign that the Catholic Church isn't true. That was kind of the objection that I would have, mm -hmm. that I would have, um, if I were to put it into words now that was in my head. Right. But, um, yeah, that just really didn't, it didn't really strike me as all that, um, all that meaningful once I, um, considered that Israel was God's chosen, like prophetic nation, as it were, to preach the gospel to the nations through the, um, through God's covenant with David, which makes it, you know, an international worldwide kingdom mm -hmm. is the idea. Um, that's just not a, not a big concern. There's a ton of evil kings, right? Um, and they could be wrong and all kinds of things. The the question was really about the nature of the high priest, things like that in the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Can he be wrong when declaring on an interpretation of the Pentateuch, things like that? Um, I still don't know. Um, I tend towards no, because um, there's that passage in John where, um, where, the, where Jesus talks about how... Um, 
you, you have to listen to what the Pharisees say, but not what they, but don't do what they do because they sit on the seat of Moses, right? So what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to suggest that they have a kind of authority from God to interpret it, which would imply a kind of um, grace given with the authority to protect them from from error and in, in in such a thing like that. Um, and then, um, and then in the other, the the other passages where the high priest prophesies, saying that Jesus would, um, or is it not is it not better that one man should die on behalf of the people than that the whole nation should perish? Mm-hmm. And you know he doesn't know what he's saying, but he's saying something that the, the Holy Spirit takes to mean something entirely different, okay. right? So there's kind of questions about authority. Sure. Um, but I'd say we we didn't take the normal approach. Yeah. Of is the papacy true? Therefore, everything else. It was kind of um, if the papacy is true, we're going to see the truth of these other things, mm. and then I'm not going to be able to prove historically or something like that um, that that this is necessarily like the case. Like that, it doesn't work that way with any dogma of the faith, right? Um, well, there there's some dogmas we can know infallibly through reason, but most of them are above our reason. Not in the sense that like we they're not reasonable. It's just that they exceed human reason. Mm-hmm. Like the Trinity, we would never be able to arrive at the Trinity on the basis of reason alone because um, when God creates, God, the Trinity works in unity. Um, so if you think about this, we trace back all created effects. What are we going to mm-hmm. get to? Is the unity of God, not the Trinity of God. Mm-hmm. How could we get there from created effects? We can't. We have to know that on the basis of divine revelation alone. Um, and so recognizing things like that are were very key to understanding that kind of relationship and how we should be kind of looking at it. You know? Was there a single doctrine uh, that was the biggest obstacle, whether or not you dealt with that at the beginning of this conversion and process or the end? I think, I think just the, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would have granted the infallibility of, of, of the church that Christ founded very early on. Mm. And that, that I wouldn't have a problem with. The question is, what is that church and how are we to define its boundaries? Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I'd say the thing that gave me the most struggle was just saying that this concrete, historical, real institution that is the Roman Catholic Church or the church is in union with the Roman Catholic Church mm-hmm. are um, is, is, you know, like the church that God established. Earlier, you had said that it broke your mind when you realized that there were several ways to read the word of God and several coherent accounts, maybe more than several. Okay. And I thought that was a really great point. So you're currently submitting to what you consider to be a coherent account of scripture, if you want to put it that way. Maybe that's the wrong way to put it. How do you know you're right then if there are other coherent accounts of scripture? Right. Right. Um, that's that's what's difficult. And now I am going to argue that there's not actually another coherent account. Okay. Um, it seemed that way to you, but now it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. In, in itself, it's not coherent. Um, to us, it it can appear that way. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a um, it's kind of a difficult point. Because um, now now that I now that I look at the at at the scriptures um, through through a Catholic lens, right. I can see that verses not only um, suggest the doctrines of the church, they're explicitly teaching Catholic doctrines in a way that I don't think is avoidable um, in many cases. And so it, um, so that changes the way I'm going to read scripture by scripture, right? Mm. Um, and so this goes back to the canon issue as well, like the canon of scripture. Who's to say that I can't take out James and not wisdom, right? Say James and wisdom comp- um, contradict. Why would I take James over wisdom, right? Like, how do I how do I make that call, or who is to make that call? Is it just some kind of interior movement of the Holy Spirit to make me recognize one or the other? Well, how is that useful for maintaining a unified body? Um, are we really supposed to maintain a unified body? Um, is really the really the the question that um, that I think once once that question's answered, it leads you either to Rome or the East mm. or and, or, and makes Protestantism look like it's not really an option anymore. Hmm. So, um, uh, 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 Newman's quote, to be steeped in history is to cease, cease to be, be Protestant. Protestant. How offensive is that to you now? <laughs> How true do you think it is? I think, I think, I do think it's true. Um, I think he's, I think he's definitely right. Um, <clears throat> St. John Henry Newman had a, certainly a big impact on me reading his essay on the, uh, development of doctrine. Mm. But um, 
Yeah, like I said a minute ago, in itself, that may be true, but to, to a Protestant. Um, don't lead with that. No, don't lead with that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't even bother going there. Um, you're, you're, you're reading theologians through a theological system as well, not just mm-hmm. scripture, mm-hmm. right? Um, now, there are very, very good um, scholars in the Reformed tradition that will just flat out admit, you know, I mean, they'll almost all admit that, um, that baptismal regeneration was held by the early church. Right. I, I'm always impressed with Zwingli's goal in his work, De Baptismo. He says, and this is almost verbatim, uh, when it comes to the matter of baptismal regeneration, I can only conclude that all of the doctors and fathers have been in error. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's, that's, I'm not... I'm not that's nuts. That's not comfortable. Um, and and, <laughs> and comfortable let either. me let me explain the logic as to, <laughs> as to why though, because a Protestant is just going to hear I, us sorry. and yeah, a Protestant is just going to hear us and go, "Well, they just hold this really high notion of tradition really arbitrarily." It's like mm-hmm. no, um, no, um, because the Holy Spirit really does indwell people, and He really does move them to right action and right thought. Right, and so when you have a consensus of thought among the fathers of the theologians. Um, <clears throat> We can see that that first of all, these are not only brilliant men, but they're holy men, and that the Holy Spirit has worked in them to speak. And so, when there's a consensus like that, it's we don't take it as the word of man, but the word yeah. of the Holy Spirit speaking in them. Now, it's not authoritative in the same way that Scripture is. Um, it's it's going to it's going to help us to you know make doctrinal definitions and things like that. But again, that's a secondary mm. mode of infallibility, not a primary mode where it's the deposit of faith itself. So like there are dogmas, for example, if, if we were to come out and, and declare, you know, 50 years from now that Mary is the mediatrix of all graces or something, which every, all the Protestants listening now are like, oh, what is that? Um, <laughs> um, that's really not as hard of a doctrine to explain as you would think. But mm-hmm. anyways, if we were to do that, um, it's it's declaring something that's in the deposit of faith of itself, but it's not there um, subjectively to us. So while it's a dogma in itself, and it's something that every, every Christian should hold, it may not be understood, um, by us and it's not binding in time for us to hold as Catholics. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty key thing to explain. Right. Back to mediatrix real quick. There's just, (laughs) there's a few ways to put that. Um, and I think the most, my favorite way to think about it is that Christ, who is the substance of all grace, all grace comes through Christ came through Mary. Right, so she's the mediatrix in in that she's in the middle, so to speak. Right, that's all that means. Just the Latin kind of word, right? Um, and Christ comes through her, and so all graces come through her in that way. There's other senses in which we talk about it too, but mm-hmm. I think we could just leave it there. Yeah, um, that was where I was like, hmm, that's that's more that's that's acceptable. Um, even when I was a Protestant, recognizing that it's like the language is kind of high, um, different. Um, but if it's second, if it's a secondary thing and it's not meeting mediator between God and man in the same way as with Christ. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking about the meaning of words, not about realities. And we have to get down to the realities, the things signified by the words, not just the words, mm-hmm. which if, if you ever find people just arguing about the use of a word, um, it's generally a good sign that you just want to like back up and, and what do we mean by yeah, that? Yeah. We don't, we don't have, um, our definitions down we really should clarify that before we move forward um you'd be surprised how often that happens you know i feel feel like everybody gets in arguments like that sometimes where we just assume a word means something and we have different meanings (laughs) and what's so frustrating is on social media people aren't there because they have hours of time to invest into some deep thought Mm -hmm. they're there to quickly dismiss you and reject you and so the what do you mean by that almost yes. never ever happens yeah, yeah it's infuriating yeah. um i had swan sona on the show over a year ago oh, yeah and you had just arrived and if i'm not mistaken it was the next day you were brought into full communion with the catholic church true yeah how, how did that happen um yeah so swan uh <clears throat> swan what a guy by the way <laughs> yes so glad I he's on our team. um yeah I, i've been talking with him a lot lately um Swan, I found him um, online on on YouTube, I think, um, arguing about the papacy. He made his argument about the new Eliakim, um, which I've noticed has blown up on online lately. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I found one of his debates to be just absolutely incredible. Which one? Um, 
I forget who it was it, with. Was it with Ortland on Capturing Christianity? No, it was um, it was a previous one. Okay. It was against like a younger Protestant. Mm. I think it was a Baptist, mm. a Reformed Baptist or something. Um, and um, and I was just amazed by his arguments um, from somebody so young. You know, yeah, it's um, infuriating it's like, for is, me. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is incredible. Um, and so, um, I told Doctor Hahn about him. And um, I forget exactly how we got in touch. Swan and I somehow got in touch later on. Um, and and I, th- I think it was through Dr. Han because Dr. Han found him and then found his email or something and called him and was mm-hmm. like, Swan, y- you, you got to come up and visit. Like, you got to come up, uh, come up to my house and visit. And, and then he called me and Liam was like, you got to come up and visit when Swan comes up and visits. And we're like, okay, we can do that. Yeah. And so we came up at um, right. September 20th of 2020. One and um, that's where I met you, and uh, yeah, we just hung out for a while and um, had some really good conversations. Um, and then the next day, I was uh, on the drive up, the entire drive up. The one I, this is this is it, actually. The question now that I think about it that held me up was um, uh, indulgences. I was stuck on them mm-hmm. for a little while because it was like, how does this? How does how does the logic of these work? Um, I don't I don't understand. If if they're just an imputation, um, now we're back to the imputation infusion thing. Um, what is the basis for the imputation? Is there a basis for the imputation? Um, I don't know. And so recognizing that that it's 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 subordinate to friendship, right? So charity is a kind of friendship with God, um, where you will the good of God and He wills the good of you, um, and recognizing those things helped contextualize it so that God is forgiving the temporal punishment due to sin on the basis of friendship with another saint or, mm. um, or e- even Christ's merits, right? Because it's the, the, the treasury of merit. In a certain sense, it's just Christ's merits, right? This, the, the, mer- the merits of the saints are, are merits of Christ, if you think about it in a certain way, because Christ's merits are the cause of the merits of the saints, mm-hmm. um, um, both in, in kind of every way, right? Um, the efficient cause, formal cause. Um, it, he causes them to work out their salvation, right? And so they're his merits. So it's it's because of that that God can forgive sins as He will, right? Um, and so recognizing that, I was like, okay, I can, I can hold that position. Um, and that's the last kind of thing that I was hung up on. And so I feel like I should come into communion with the church, otherwise. Um, it's it would be rather dangerous um and since i was already baptized catholic i just had to go to confession so i just went to confession the next day and um what was that communion like? here it was do you remember going to confession prior I do. to that um, you were much younger oh oh no i was i i i didn't when i was younger because you I, never went no so this was um, your first confession yeah yeah there was my yeah like i said i never spent <laughs> never spent like a conscious hour that wow. i could remember in, yeah. the, in the catholic church that's right i was um so what was that experience like for you because it happened rather quickly, didn't it? Didn't Scott kind of? Yeah, it did happen quickly. Yeah, he 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 <laughs> um, texted or called one of the priests down at St. Peter's, um, mm. Father Michael Baker. Ah, um, and uh, and had you spent a great deal of time writing out your no. the serious sins you could remember? No, no. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I wrote out I wrote out a lot, but um, yeah, I kind of just went through like categories. It wasn't super yeah super hard to figure out. Um, but it was, um, of course, we're not bound to confess that which we've forgotten either. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a really interesting kind of new experience. But I just felt very, like, this is really good. You know, it gets a lot off your, off your conscience. You know, mm-hmm. it's like really relaxing, and that's something even for, even for um, my Protestant friends. There's, I, I know several who are like, man, I would love to have confession. Yeah, I really think that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, um, I've never been uh, a Protestant Christian, but I've heard Jimmy Aiken say that when he was, he would, and this is just his experience, I'm not saying this is universally the experience mm-hmm. of Protestants, but he would have to kind of bend his mind into knots to finally feel forgiven having repented. Mm-hmm. And he said one of the things he finds so relieving as a Catholic is you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. You just have to confess. Yeah. And he... Uh, receive absolution and it doesn't really matter how you feel it's been taken care of yeah yeah it's wonderful yeah are you in touch with any friends from your old calvinist school yes um quite a few actually 
How many um, of them think you've gone nuts or have <laughs> left Christianity and how many of them are open to considering your arguments? I don't think there's been a single one that would say I'm not a Christian. Um, Who's actually engaged you probably. Yeah, I'm realize, sure there's many outside yeah. that think I'm like nuts and some kind of apostate, but <clears throat> yeah, nobody, nobody I know well who's actually talked with me would say that. Mm. Um, a lot of them see that, that, that Roman Catholicism is reasonable. Um, they just don't. Yeah. necessarily subscribe so yeah um yeah that's an interesting thing um the, the the reaction the reactions i got were not as um were not nearly as um harsh in some ways as i would have expected mm. um it was difficult with my parents at first but they were just worried you know they still are um I mean, they're just very loving people you know yeah. um great parents so What's your advice for people out there who may wonder what their responsibility is towards their non-Catholic parents? Because these people change your diaper and the idea that you're going to somehow declare the truth to them and have them convert must be a hard pill to swallow for parents. Mm -hmm. How are you interacting with them? What have you learned? What should other kind of Catholic children of non-Catholic parents take into account? Yeah. Um, a prophet has honor except in his own hometown right um i think that's something you're gonna you're gonna find there is you know they raised you and gave you food and life and you know and taught you most of what you know it's gonna be difficult to um to kind of say uh i think i'm right you know <laughs> um <laughs> so it's just something you just live like show them you love them you know and be there don't just separate and disappear mm -hmm. or something you know um, yeah, I'd say that's the most important thing. So what's the next step for you? Are you doing your master's here or? What, I'm what? still, I'm still trying to figure out my bachelor's. Yeah. I still got to figure that out. Um, there's a lot, a lot to, um, figure out very quickly. I'm hoping to go to Franciscan, stay with, uh, Dr. Han for a little while longer. Um, and for those at home who might think, well, why would you be living with Dr. Han? They have a large house yes. and, and over the years they've had hundreds of people live with yeah, them, if I think I'm not like, mistaken. Yeah, I think it was like 60 something. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, they, they have, they have a lot of students stay with them. So I'm um, just, I've just been staying there for a little while and it's been great to get to know them. Mm. It really has. They've been so, so generous and kind. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, actually. Anything else you want to touch on? Yes. There's, um. There's a few other, you know, Eric Ibarra. Mm -hmm. um, I, didn't, I didn't even cover like the church we ended up going to and anything like that. Oh my gosh. That's like a huge the part The church of you visited? The or? church we went to in Orlando. Okay. Um, so we were, we were received into the Anglican Ordinariate. Ah. Um, and so um, at, at Incarnation Catholic Church down there, it is um, our first, our first ever mass, <clears throat> our first ever actual Catholic mass that Beautiful. Liam and I went to was um at the Wednesday. Anglican Ordinary? Yeah, the oh, Ang what Anglican Ordinary. Yeah. How oh, beautiful. It was it was just transcendent, you know. Um when we sung the Our Father, it was just like tears in my eyes, you know, just one of the most beautiful experiences because mm. we'd never sung that as Protestants. So then um, how, how does that work? It, uh because I'm an Eastern Catholic, mm -hmm. but I was brought in to the East. You were baptized, presumably Roman Catholic mm -hmm. and was it, is it the, how then were you brought into the ordinary? I was, um, we had a dispensation from a bishop so that I could just be confirmed in the ordinary. So I do belong to the Anglican ordinary, but yeah, Liam and I were confirmed January 2nd of 2022. Could you do me a solid? Mm -hmm. Could you buy that Lutheran church down the road? And let's make that an ordin Anglican ordinary. I, I would parish? love that. Let's, let's I, make that happen. I really would love that. <laughs> um, it would be it would be incredible to have an ordinary at parish. Mm. Um, but that, that parish was just, um, just glorious. So any, anybody who's in Orlando, please go by there say hi to father holiday for me. Mm. Um, just a wonderful place. Oh, also Eric Ibarra. Yeah. Um, he goes there. Okay. Um, he goes to that parish. So we ended up talking a lot. Um, mm. I interact with him fairly often. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's wonderful. Um, he is. So get his book in the papacy and read that. Have you read, have you read it yet? I've read like a hundred pages, but I haven't even put a dent I've in it. I've not read it it's yet. It's massive. No, I've not read it yet. Yeah. Actually, I have a discount code too for, I don't know if this Do is okay with you, for, um, yeah, for, for MAS Academic. What um, is it? So EA Ethan, it'll be 25% off if somebody oh, just awesome. wants to use that. Yeah, they there were kind go. enough to give me that. We should have thrown that out at the beginning. Could we put that in the description of this video? So EA. EA Ethan, I think it's capital E, capital A. 
Ethan. Thun. Yeah. E- and just well, well, capital. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be E A and then Ethan. Yeah. But just to clarify for the viewers, he you get like uh, that's to support you, right? The no, promo that's, code. That's for um. That's for Emmaus Academic. Yeah, he doesn't get books. money from it. He's no. just he's oh, just okay, shilling cool. Scott's books because he lives there, and that's a kind thing to do. Okay, yeah. very cool. Also, uh, Emmaus Academic puts out amazing books. So. Yes, yes, yeah, they do. Yeah, good. I should get a promo code. And start making that sweet money from them. <laughs> promo code. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was gonna. Never mind. <laughs> just type in the words. I'll tell you that joke later. Bling bling. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'd say the the last thing I, I want to touch on is just. Um, just the the beauty of the Catholic faith is really what what drew us in in many ways. You know, not not so much the liturgies and things like that, as just seeing like the coherence of the theology and how everything fits together in this kind of incarnational lens. Like seeing the church as the continuation of the incarnation, um, just um, just amazed all of us. I think in recognizing that you know it's Christ's ministry really continuing on. Um, throughout the ages so that the the union that christ has with the church is not like not it's not a metaphor it's it's metaphysical um and that's something that i think is misunderstood um a lot is that people just hear body of christ and they think okay yeah um we're just like this visible body of people it's like no scripture uses the language of like joints and ligaments and mm. and all these things and that's to signify something um something much greater that can't be expressed because Paul says all over the place, I speak to you in a human way as to children, right? Um, it's a much higher union than we could possibly imagine. A spiritual union is much greater than something merely physical. Now mm-hmm. we have both with Christ and that he took on our flesh and offered it to the father as a pleasing aroma, right? And um, and we're united to him in that way. It's just glorious. So that's just, those are just the main kind of theological things that just Wow. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for being on the show. God bless you and your dear friends and your old professors and the good school you went to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're living here in Stuby. Me too. Me too. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. You're welcome.